Kush and Kentrash, the world's most dangerous podcast. Hey, what's going on? This is Buck Ballsy. And I'm Emmett Flores. Welcome to another episode of Kush and Chemtrails. We got a very special guest in the house with us today, Mr. Tom O'Neill. Welcome, welcome. Doing? Thank you. How are you yes. doing? Good, good, thanks. Man. Doing well. Glad to have so you. So excited sir. to thanks have you here, dude. Me. It is a great pleasure, man. Man, amazing. For you people that don't know out there, Tom is an investigative journalist. Is that correct? Is that a sure good is, title? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so how long you been doing this? Uh... Well, it took me 20 years to do the book, and prior to that, I was a magazine and newspaper writer for about 10, 15 years. And was it freelance writing? I was doing freelance, and I got a contract with an entertainment magazine, so I was doing entertainment reporting, got bored with that, and then started doing investigative pieces about the entertainment industry, Right, right? and then it kind of evolved into true crime. Wow. And you're originally, where are you from? Philadelphia. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Philly. I was out there. My son actually goes to Swarthmore. Oh, really? My, yeah, my youngest son. My two brothers went to Haverford. Oh, well, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. rivals. Yeah, yeah. yeah Haverford. Swarthmore is a good school. Brotherly yeah, that, love, right? Yeah, that's mm-hmm. one of the schools he went out to out there was Haverford they, to check out, you know, to yeah, see where yeah. he was going to go. Swarthmore is great, though. Yeah, yeah. I love it out there. That's fantastic. So, the big question. What's that? Who done it? <laughs> Who done it? <laughs> Who done what? Man, that book, Chaos. Roger Rabbit. That book, Chaos, mm-hmm. is phenomenal. Oh, thank you. That's a 20-year... Uh, compilation of like passion right there dude yeah That's ob- obsession insane. passion determination insanity i love it i don't recommend it i love it it's you not, have to be insane to investigate something good, like that yeah, it's not a good way to spend 20 years right? but in the right. end it feels good that it's behind me yeah mostly yeah well congratulations mm-hmm. i got to uh, do I you, bought the, do you feel like the work picked you uh yeah <laughs> yeah i did not go looking for it it happened in a very accidental way and i don't think you know, in hindsight, if I had it to do it all over again, I might have said no, hmm. you know, because it took, it took a lot away from me for 20 years. I didn't have a great life for that time. I'm enjoying myself now. That's good. And this this stuff is fun. That's good. But, you know, was it worth 20 years of missing weddings <coughs> and parties and travel and living pretty poor? I don't know. Maybe. Man. That's crazy, bro. Mm-hmm. A legacy. Yeah. Something. <laughs> Definitely. You know. Well, we appreciate the work and um, definitely appreciate you being here. The oh. first time I saw you was on Joe Rogan's podcast. Right. So now to have you here in person is kind of <laughs> surreal. So, yeah, man, um, thank you for making the, the journey down. And, yeah, um, we really appreciate it. Oh, sure. We're I like looking it forward to <coughs> some insight. I Any know, excuse to come to Topanga Canyon. Yeah, hell yeah, buddy. Here we are. Yeah, we we're, love it. We're right in the heart of it, aren't we? We are indeed. Mm-hmm. As, so, the, <coughs> as the people will come to see <coughs> What ended up happening was, uh, you know, I told you I was reading that book. Uh, Little Canyon book? Yeah, The Weird Scenes in the Canyon. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> it mentioned how many times uh, it just kept talking about Topanga. Mm-hmm. And I've been up here for so long. Uh, and I knew that the Manson family was up here, but not to the, to that extent. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I had no idea <clears throat> excuse me, about the Gary Hinman murder because... Yeah. Or the, uh, what was it, uh, Ronald Shea? Donald Shea? Uh, yeah, Shorty Shea. Shorty Shea, yeah, they don't, they talk about... They're lesser now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sharon Tate. I, mm-hmm. I didn't even know the last name of the uh, the LaBiancas. I didn't even, mm-hmm. I just, you always hear Sharon Tate, Sharon Tate. Yeah. So when I found out Gary Hinman lived up here, and that uh, Bobby Beausoleil, is that how you pronounce his Beausoleil, last name? yeah. When he lived up here, uh, I went to all those spots. Mm-hmm. And just checked out everything even the dude's pad i mean I, but i've known this too i've been there before uh the guy from canned heat have you heard of that band oh sure yeah yeah he od'd in that pad right there and that pad never it, which where was it <coughs> it's off to Panga canyon boulevard um uh-huh. right past uh highvale okay on the left side yeah and it's and it's uh fenced off but you can go around the fence and go across the bridge and the bridge is missing it has relates made with like railroad ties mm-hmm. but it's missing some railroad ties so you gotta okay. be really careful because you'll yeah. fall into the creek about 20 feet below uh-huh and then uh well it's all rocks there's no water now, now the good thing is i'm gonna keep you guys on balance because i don't know a lot of the stuff that we're going to be <laughs> discussing yeah. so for the people at home i'm gonna pre- probably be like them like can we are, are those names that you just said are those artists Oh yeah, Canned Heat was a great yeah. band in the '60s. Okay. Uh, okay, I don't know the name of that. Was it the singer who died or that great voice? Um, I'm not sure. I'll tell you right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm going you. home to the country. I I can't sing or I do it for you. That's a song that probably their best known song. Going okay. home. To the, yeah, 
And uh, I mean, you know, in the 60s, this was like a rock haven. Everybody left Laurel Canyon. Gotcha. Because uh, it got too commercialized and they came out here. Okay. And and Soze has broken that down on our podcast for some mm. of the listeners. Um, and I'm just going to be like, during the beginning, kind of setting the foundation for the people that don't know to catch them up to speed, and then I'll let you guys, you know, do for your sure. thing. I won't keep on interrupting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all good. But I'm uh, curious, how old are you? I'm uh, 37. Okay. Yeah. Because it's it is funny. I that's another reason the book is so long is I got to provide context because I can't assume that everybody your age is going to know references to like Cointel Pro. Chaos, MK Ultra, and the bands and stuff. Right. Yeah, and a, a lot point. of those um, programs we're hip to, but the bands is what I, I Emmett often puts me on game, and we mm. did a little dive on you know some of those bands, so we know a little bit. But I just want to make sure that everybody's on yeah. the same level. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, Can't Heat, Alan Wilson. Okay. Alan Wilson. Yeah. Um, I guess it was uh, Bob the Bear Height. They found him uh, overdose there, and they called uh, Alan Does Blind out. Uh, September 3rd, 1970. Okay. And that's in Topanga? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's right there on Topanga Canyon Boulevard. Mm. And then Gary Hinman's at uh, the first recorded Manson murder. Mm -hmm. There was many. There had to be many more. Mm. Dudes were fucking probably Likely, yeah, yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. Uh, You know what's interesting is when I was looking up all these different stories in that um, that, um, scenes from the Canyon book, Mm -hmm. they mentioned uh, uh, Jane Doe. Mm-hmm. Called her Jane Doe number 46. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they found her, yeah. I believe, in the fall of 69 up there off Mulholland. Mm-hmm. And she was stabbed 147 times I remember in the throat that. and the chest. And right away, I'm like, yo. Reese this- Jerverson, I think, is the woman. Yes. They finally identified yes. her. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. they identified her yeah. in 2015 after 46 years. That's exactly her name. Mm-hmm. From Iceland, right? Something like that? Um, or or Something, yeah. some uh, Like something Nordic. Nor- Nor- yeah, Nor- yeah, Nor- yeah, something like that. Hmm. Yeah, bro. And so, but the thing was, they said that Bugliosi had said that she might have known something about the member with a bullet in his head. Yeah, zero. John <laughs> Philip Hot. And that was in Venice, They found right? her right after. Well, yeah, yeah. He was um, a so-called suicide in Venice. Right. They said he was playing Russian roulette, but he had a full, full clip. Yeah, yeah. Like all the bullets yeah. were in the gun, but and they were playing Russian roulette. With three Manson family members. Remind me. Bugliosi, who's that? Bugliosi. He's the prosecutor. The prosecutor. He prosecuted mm-hmm. the case, and then he wrote the book on the case, Helter Skelter, which Got it. to this day is the best-selling true crime book of all time. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yep. Okay. So Bugliosi yeah. is one of the major figures in my book because I look not just at the case, and it goes out into a lot of bit, different tendrils, but I look at his choices and, and uh, prosecution and take a lot of it apart. Mm. But, um, yeah, Jane Doe 59. Yeah, exactly. I don't think the Manson family did that. You don't think so? Uh, I mean, I'm not convinced that they right, didn't. Right, right, the right. cops, the cop who'd been working that case, as obsessed as I, and this is what happens to cops. You know, For they sure. do cold cases, and if they don't solve them, sometimes even after they retire, they can't stop. Right. So this guy was going back and going back, and he, he was meeting with me on his way to finally identifying her. And when they did, he and I met a couple times. He still thinks they did it. I haven't talked to him for probably two years, so I don't know whether how far he's gotten. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> there's others that I think are more likely. There was wow. a, a, a young girl named Marina Habe. Yeah. Who, yeah. Lived, she, she's in there, too. She's the first one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I that's one of my heartbreaking stories is uh, her mom died last year at age 99. Wow. And that was her only daughter. Wow. And she saw her daughter pulled into a car. Oh, shit. And driven away and never saw her again. Fuck. And I used to go see her and interview her at her old folks' home, well, her apartment, and then she ended up in one. And she said she didn't want to die until she found out what happened to her daughter. Wow. And she did, and I I think the Manson family did that one. Fuck, dude. And they just rolled up and took her? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, there's a guy alive who I think knows the truth. It was a guy that she went out on a date with that night. I, I believe that he had relationships with the family and he was involved with stuff. And he was originally the first suspect and he was very from a very wealthy family out here. This isn't in my book. This will be in the next book. Yeah. Uh, he won't Exclusive. talk to me. Yeah, I bet he fucking won't. <laughs> <laughs> no statute of limitations on that. Fuck, dude. Yeah. Damn. That's fucking crazy, dude. Mm-hmm. Imagine. 
we're both parents, mm-hmm. so I can't imagine no. that would be like horrible. Oh, yeah, man, I, mean, I wasn't I'm, even going there. There's a lot of people, likely. I mean, I hate to say it because I can't prove it yet, but at least a half dozen to a dozen people that I think were killed by the family that yeah. were never connected to them. Some here in L.A., some out in the desert in Death Valley. Right. What mm-hmm. about that? Uh, and you wrote about the kid in the book. Was it an Italian name? Oh, yeah. Terinelli? Filippo Tenerelli. Yeah. Terinelli? I'm convinced that they did that. And that that was, was up in Bishop, California. Yeah. And uh, he was called a suicide. Damn, that's quite a ways away. Yeah. Well, that's near their hideout. You know, when they were finally apprehended, they left the Spawn Ranch here in Chatsworth and moved out to Death Valley to a place called the Barker Ranch, mm. which is way up in the you know in the mountains above the desert. Mm. I, I actually went there for the first time ever last November, and you can't get up there unless you have, I don't even know what they're called. What are those? Because I'm not a big outdoors guy. The chains on the? You need these real, like, Jeeps with really high wheels. Oh, that, yeah, yeah. Four-wheel drives or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Oh, we no. I went up with a bunch of ex-cops, and uh, I had no idea how remote it was. And that's where they were living for the last couple of months before they were finally arrested. Mm. And Bishop was one of the the, lo- the closest towns. It was probably about 30 miles, 20 miles wow. where they could go get supplies. For sure. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Damn. Mm-hmm. And they stole his bug, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and they, they used to steal bugs and convert them into doom buggies. Doom buggies, right. So it makes sense. It all lines up. Yeah, they found the, the bug uh, pushed over a cliff, blood stained, <laughs> and no body. And then he showed up in town, and um, the original. See, I always have to say this: the official narrative was that the police decided that he had pushed the car over himself because uh, <laughs> he wanted to kill himself, and he wanted to drive it over, but it kept getting stuck. Yeah, on like rocks. Right. So then he just pushed it over, and then their explanation for there being blood in it was: then he went down like two hundred feet to the bottom to uh-huh. get stuff from the car and cut his hands when he was getting the stuff. Then he went into Bishop and um, got a hotel room, went out and bought a shotgun and a gun case and a cleaning kit. And then two days later, well, three days, three mornings later, they found him shot in the mouth in in his room and said it was a suicide. But what wasn't reported, and I found out, and this is in my book, is the car that was actually pushed over wasn't pushed over until after he was dead. Yeah. Because there was a highway patrolman who went by that area every day and he a couple times a day. And he said, I saw it. I never I would have seen it. Right. It wasn't there until after he was dead. So right. somebody. Yeah. Mm. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so in your book, I noticed uh, there's a pattern of people covering covering for, up. for the Manson family. Yeah. And. Um, what, what what's that about what do you think well in a nutshell um my book right um i make a case that there were more people who were involved with the manson murders and the family that were um i don't know how to say manipulating the group provoking them to do stuff mm-hmm. they had an agenda and then after all these murders happened they were kind of erased from the picture gotcha they were withdrawn and uh, they were kind of, <laughs> it sounds crazy, but uh, agents in uh, intelligence, United right. States intelligence that had um, a couple of programs uh, that were trying to kind of d- diminish the power of the left wing movement and the hippies, right. which was peaking in 69. Right. And they needed to make them look more dangerous and like right. boogeyman and, you know, crazy and, Manson stepped in and was perfect for that. Right. And that's uh, COINTELPRO? That One meant? of them, yeah. There was COINTELPRO, which was FBI. FBI. Chaos, which mm-hmm. was uh, CIA. Right. And the and two of them. And that's also the name of your book, Chaos. Yeah, yeah. And then it has a, what's after that? Chaos? Ch- Chaos, Charles Manson, the CIA, and the secret history of the 60s. You guys get out there and pick that up. I bought it last night at 8 p.m. And I was up until 6 a.m. reading. And I'm on page 250. Man, I oh, was boy. so, I was really excited. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude, I couldn't put it down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great. Good, good. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad people it. like it. Yeah. yeah. Do you, are you, uh, have you, followed the manson stuff at all well i told you i hadn't at all really leading up to this until you started talking about it on the pod but i watched a couple of his interviews (laughs) and i was just like enthralled like he was awesome well let me not say Ah, too late bro (laughs) the interviews were 
But we've talked about it on the pod before, how people that can be charismatic yeah, bro. or people that can be, you know, very entertaining. Yeah. Those can be the people that lead people astray because they don't see it coming, you nah. know? So, yeah, when I was watching it, I was like, yo, dude, is like he was killing those interviewers. Like, yeah. that's what I remember taking away. Like, what was, I it, was Tom just, Snyder? Was, I was that one of the dudes? One of them. He yeah. was I was laughing mad, the bro. whole time. He yeah. was so mad. He's like. So what is it about you? Why do you think you have such a magnetic personality? And that fool's like, well, you came here, didn't you? Man, that made him mad, He was bro. pretty smart. Yeah. yeah. Pretty clever. He was crafty. Yeah. For, yeah. An un- crafty. for an uneducated man, he was smart as hell. He, he was making some know. good points. He wasn't, he wasn't very well educated, right? No, he wasn't very well. He was more, wasn't it? His, his he, mom he was, was supposedly illiterate. Uh, was pardon me? Pro- was my mother a prostitute? Yeah, she was a prostitute, pretty, uh, petty criminal. Um, and he was not, he was street smart. Right. You know, he was raised in, in penitentiaries mostly. Mm. Uh, he, I think he was in his first uh, juvenile hall when he was about nine or ten for stealing right. cars, <clears throat> and pretty much in and out of federal institutions until he was released and from prison in, in Termi- at Terminal Island in right. L.A. in '67. <clears throat> down there uh, by Long Beach. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know he was a he was a con man, right? Uh, but not a violent guy prior to these murders right now let me ask you a question uh they said he learned to play guitar in the uh in the joint yeah between yeah 60 and 67 yeah he got, got really into the beatles well even before that before he was that. playing guitar and he was taught by this guy alvin carpus who was a part of Mar- ma barker's gang uh, uh back in the 30s right right um, and um he was taught himself how to play guitar and taught by him and between 60 and 67 uh no he was starting probably in the well maybe the early 60s yeah early 60s yeah, okay yeah, yeah and came out of prison saying that he wanted to be you know in the music industry in the business right and uh he, he did he composed music played guitar and uh he impressed some neil, some y- neil young mm-hmm. neil young thought it, i fucking love neil young bro heart of mm-hmm. gold Harvest mm-hmm. Moon mm-hmm. I jam that shit all the time yeah Neil Young's and the, great and he's infatuated not infatuated but he said he was a great musician bro mm-hmm. he, like, he was and he's man. one of the only rock and roll kind of guys who were you know internationally famous and accomplished who admits that not only they had they had met Manson a few times yeah. but they were impressed with his yeah. music yeah. yeah that's true everyone else denied that shit like he wanted to take him to his label I think it was Mo Austin or yep. something and, and yep. yeah that's exactly what it was and Mo Austin mm-hmm. would meet with him mm-hmm. yeah yeah, and I also learned in your book Doris Day shot him down pretty harshly too. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know that. Well, Terry Melcher was Doris Day's right. only child, uh-huh. and he was a record producer. He did um, Buffalo Springfield, mm-hmm. the, the Birds, Birds. Um, Paul Revere and the Raiders. Mm-hmm. He had his own band first. Uh, it was like a surf band called Terry, and I forget the other guy's name. But um, his mother was America's sweetheart, For Doris sure. Day, and he. What my book exposes is that Terry Melcher was one of the people who was protected by the prosecutor and the police. He had a much more intense relationship with Manson, including that his mother met Manson because he wanted, she had her own record label. She was a singing, I mean, she was an actress, a singer, and Terry um, produced her music and he wanted to produce Manson on her label. And she's like, no. (laughs) Yeah. And she was not the sweet woman that, America thought she right. was. She had a pretty uh, salty history, and uh, she actually said something like, "What was it?" Uh, I can't. Remember, something like, "Fuck, get, get, I don't want that fucking." If dirty. you think I'm gonna sign you, you're out of your fucking mind. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, "Damn, Doris Day said that." <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah. <clears throat> that's yeah. the thing about a book like this. You, you, a lot of your myths are busted because I yeah. thought that she was this golden girl. I had no idea. Are you familiar with Doris Day? The name sounds familiar, but a, a face doesn't pop up. For Actress. Me. Yeah. Was she on television? Well, she started in the movies. Um, she only died a year or a year or two years ago. Wow! And she and some of these people have longevity. She was ninety eight or nine. No, but she was the number one movie star in the United States from like the late forties to the late fifties. Was 50s. she affiliated with the company we used to work for? I don't know. Did, did we used to drive? I think, man. Maybe, maybe, know. possibly. Man, that name just sounds familiar. We used to work familiar. together at a transportation company. Yeah. Well, she lived up in Carmel, though, the last two oh, okay. years. Yeah, up there by, uh, that's that, where Clint that, Eastwood that was name. up there. Yeah. Right? Carmel. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, okay, so yeah, she shit on him. Yeah. She wasn't going for it. Yeah, but Terry <clears throat> became obsessed with him. Yeah. And uh, had some of them living with him. And right. then when the murders happened, 
kind of the most infamous Manson family murders of Sharon Tate uh, and three, four other people at her house. That was Terry's old house. Right. That Manson was familiar with from having been there before. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, it's hard for me to talk about what happened because I always have to clarify everything that well you know this is the there's an official version and then there's the stuff i right. found out was lied about right but you know a bunch mm-hmm. of these people got killed at this house at the top of beverly or bel-air that uh was rented by roman polanski the right. director the who was director. in london at the time right and uh well on august 8th in the middle of the night um manson dispatched four of his followers there and told them he didn't he, the official version is he didn't know who lived there now, just that it was where Terry used to live. Right. And told them, to, his followers, to go up there and kill everybody in the house, whoever they encountered. So it was Sharon Tate, who was Manson, or excuse me, Polanski's mm-hmm. eight and a half month pregnant wife, Damn. film star, and um, Abigail Folger, mm-hmm. coffee heiress. Folger's coffee, bro. Yeah. Her boyfriend, uh, Wojciech Fakowski, who was a Polish wannabe filmmaker that had come over kind of Roman took care of him he didn't have a job he was really just That's a one, druggie a and um, Jay Sebring who was a celebrity hairstylist right right and, and he also ex boyfriend. Yeah. yeah see yeah. that's what started making me look at kind of like at Polanski was like well, mm-hmm. wait a minute bro mm-hmm. all kinds of shit started going in my head like, like is this a sacrifice well not well look we'll, we'll trip on this look at Jay Sebring used to date her right mm-hmm. so then I'm like and this is total speculation bro but I'm just like, well, fuck, maybe it wasn't even dude's kid, right? Cause, well, a lot of people think that. Yeah, maybe it was his kid. And because, like, why is he there with her, right? Because it's, like it's almost like a, like a double date. Even though those couple, the couple had been staying there, uh, Frykowski, since April, and right? I, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> or, yeah, April. So um, the, the official story is uh, Roman stole Sharon from Jay. Jay and Sharon had been a couple for three or four years. Right. And then she met Roman, and he was an up-and-coming director, and he cast her in a film, and during the making of the film, they start, they became lovers, and she broke Jay's heart. But Jay remained very close to her and to Roman, and then when Roman was in, in London, and Sharon had come back, she was also in Europe making a movie, but she came back about, I guess, the day of the moon landing, so July 20th. Jay was at her side uh, the entire three weeks prior to both of their murder, and what one thing that's kind of new information, not not from me, but um, um, Jay Sebring's lawyer has now told Jay's nephew, a guy named Anthony D. Maria, who made a film about his uncle that mm-hmm. came out about a month or two ago, and on I guess on camera, I still haven't seen it. This is just what I've been told. He said that um, he had gone over to London to deliver divorce papers to wow. Roman. Wow. Because Sharon wanted to, vo- to divorce him and go back to Jay. Wow. So, I mean, Roman was a prime suspect because the hu- husband always is, even yeah. if you're not in the country. That doesn't mean he couldn't, yeah. <laughs> For sure. But, you know, And that's... he kept delaying his return, bro. He was supposed to come back with her. Like, dude, your, your wife is eight and a half months pregnant and you don't come back. And she's begging him to come back. Yeah, begging. And she was like, dude, like, and he wouldn't come back, bro. Yeah. It's suspicious as fuck, right? And then he comes back two days or three days, rather, after mm-hmm. the murders. You know, and eight years later, he gets caught uh, sodomizing a 13 year old girl. And he admitted to that. He admitted to it. He, he said well, it, was, yeah. it was willing like she she was complying. And I'm like, bro, I'm that age right now. What do you mean? She complied. What do you mean? It's a child, bro. So that's the mentality we're dealing with. And mm-hmm. you also said I never heard this about a videotape that they found there. Yeah. Yeah. You want to expand on that a little bit? Can well, you? I've never seen it. So all <clears throat> right, I, right. you know, I had one source and it was Bugliosi, the prosecutor, who told me that in his book, he claimed that this video that was taken from the house after the murders, uh, they thought it could be important evidence. And it turned out it was just Roman and Sharon making love. Right. Then Bugliosi told me in my first meeting with him that it was actually um, Roman forcing Sharon to have sex with two men against her will Boom. and videotaping it. And uh, he had lied about that in the book. Um, and that's where kind of, we're talking about it took me 20 years. This was supposed to be a three-month magazine assignment. <laughs> and when I began, I thought I was going to turn it around and then move on to the next job. Right. But things like that started happening where I would get people to tell me stuff they had never told before. And then the next thing I knew, the whole official narrative 
kind of fell apart. And then I had to try to figure out, well, if it didn't happen that way, what way did it happen? And then right. why did people lie and, and actually break laws to, you know, mm-hmm. to put forward a false narrative, which exactly. is stuck to this day, 50 some years later. Right. And so Manson, he paroled in 67 from Terminal Island. You said in the book he violated his parole. Well, actually, I, I might have been on the podcast that you said it. Did he violate his parole? It's in the book, too. Time? Yeah, yeah. Th- it's... Because he left San Francisco. Well, no, he was he was paroled to I mean, excuse Terminal me. He, Island. Yeah, he left L.A. And then that's his district. Right. So he's not allowed to leave there exactly. without permission. Yeah. He just left, went out to San Francisco, and a week or so after he was up there, he thought, well, I better turn, go to the parole office here and tell them I want to live here. That's not how it works. You not don't at tell all. him anything. Not at all. And he walked in, and what I got that was exclusive was the correspondence from the parole office there to the parole office in L.A. saying, who does this guy think he is? He just turned up here without permission. What are we supposed to do? And then I found a kind of a chain of evidence to show that they had decided to let him stay up there. And I present, again, um, a circumstantial case that he became an informant, or he was given extra kind of liberties. Mm -hmm. He was constantly breaking the law, and instead of being violated and sent back to prison, like most people would be. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, he was released. Give give the listeners some examples of some of the crimes while he's on parole, and he's already been in jail now for seven years, federal institution, he gets paroled, and what are some of the crimes? Well, the first one was, so he's he's paroled in uh, March of 67, Goes up to San Francisco, the Bay Area, uh, gets assigned a, a new parole officer up yeah. there uh, named Roger Smith, and then and that guy you felt like could have been possibly like a handler or yeah, something like yeah, that, yeah, right? Yeah, and definitely. you said that they had met in Joliet at one time. Well, actually, that's what his Roger ah, but Smith's, you said you said that the past didn't the the times the, the didn't years add up. didn't add up. Yeah, um, his assistant who worked with him said that Roger had told her he met him in the federal prison system Mm -hmm. when he was a grad student at University of Chicago and and doing part-time work at Joliet, right? which he did. Roger did do that. And Manson was in the system there. I could never find... And again, you know, at this point, I know that just because there's no record of it doesn't mean it didn't happen. Especially with what you've uncovered. Yeah, yeah. He was in Texas uh, in, in custody for about a month while Roger was at Joliet. And he was waiting to be um, extradited back to L.A. And that was on a charge of uh, not going to one parole hearing in 1960. They sent him back to prison. Exactly. So anyway, he could have been moved around then. Who knows? But I didn't find a record of him there. But here, then jump to 67. He's not showing up anywhere for parole hearings. Roger, it's more like a friendship. And in July of 67, so he's out about three, four months, He has a 14-year-old girl named Ruth Ann Morehouse who's become his lover, and she's run away from home, and he's just starting to form his following. He's got, like, uh, four women. Who was the first one? Uh, Mary Bruner. And that's the one he had Pooh Bear with? The kid? Yeah. uh, Michael, right? Michael, yeah. Michael Bruner? Yeah. He dropped the name Manson, right? He doesn't go. And then he's got a kid named Charlie Manson Jr. that offed himself, huh? Uh, No. Well, yes, yes. That guy... um, that was from a first marriage. Right, 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 yeah, right, right, yeah. right. And he was older, but he killed himself in like 93 or 94. Yeah, yeah. So Michael Br- Michael Brunner actually Michael Brunner. called me for the first time about a week ago. No way. Years. So I've been talking <clears throat> to him, yeah. You talked to Manson's son? Yeah. Is yeah. he a charmer? Like oh, his no, old, he's like a, his no, old no, man? No, he's, he's completely, <laughs> you know, he stayed off the radar for years, and I was trying to interview his mom for 20 years, and Holy she wouldn't shit. talk to me. right. And then I just got a, I think it was first, it was an email from him about a week or two ago saying he was hoping he could talk to me. I could answer some questions for him. And I'm like, sure. That's phenomenal. So we had a really nice phone conversation. I've been helping him with stuff that he's trying to figure out about what happened during that period. Yeah. And Did she catch any charges? <clears throat> she uh, would have been sent to prison for the murder of Gary Hemman because she participated oh, wow. in that with Susan Atkins That's, and, wow. uh, and Beausoleil. But she uh, got a deal with the DA's office to testify against the other two. So she wasn't going to get a prison sentence. She testified against the other two. But then in the middle of the trial, she said, everything I've said is a lie. They didn't do it. We wow. didn't do it. So she should have had her um, immunity deal revoked. Right. But Bosley got convicted anyway. Yeah. So <clears throat> she had a great lawyer who argued that it didn't matter that she 
retracted because yeah. he had still been convicted. Right. So she had got to, she skated. Wow. And she went back to Wisconsin where she was from and she's never given an interview in all these years. Holy shit. And uh, the son, Michael, who I, he's the only kid I, I think can 100%, I know we can 100% sure say he's Manson's kid. There are probably others, but yeah. a lot of them are fakes. For sure. Um, he he only went public after Manson died uh, about who he was. Oh, yeah. So he gave his first interview to the LA Times. Oh, so yeah, no one even knew this kid was... Oh, no, we all knew he was alive and I'd actually found him. Oh, I wow. Never, I never called him. Okay, he just I, hadn't... Yeah, I didn't, you know, yeah, I, I didn't think there was anything, he was too young to be valuable to me. I just wanted to talk to his mom. So I did call his mom's sister and his grandparents a bunch because uh, they were the only ones who I thought would put... I didn't want to bother a kid then because yeah. he was younger. Yeah. <clears throat> but... um. He's good. He's a nice guy. Wow. That's Straight wild. and narrow. That is wild. <laughs> so, so Manson yeah, in, in, the in July. Right? Yeah. So uh, the police came to get her. Yeah. Because her mother told them where she was with yeah. this ex-con who was about 31 or 32 then. The police show up and Manson won't let them into this cabin he's in with her. And uh, when they tried to come in, he, he had a physical confrontation with them. So he got charged, like three charges, interfering with a police officer on duty, resisting or everything. Right. All that <clears throat> stuff should have sent him right back. For sure. Yeah. But he didn't go back. And for the next two years, he'd been arrested. He was arrested on weapons charges, drug charges, rape charges, stolen car charges. And they let him skate. Bro. Every single time. Catch, release, catch, release. Yeah. That's wild. Mm. And let me ask you a question. Now, you brought up, um, you were talking uh, on... Um, on Rogan's podcast about um, uh, the MK Ultra program, mm -hmm. and you know, him and I have discussed it on this on this pod as well. But um, what I didn't know was that they were getting um, people for the program from federal penitentiaries. Yeah, yeah. So then it would be a, at this time. Then it very possibly yeah that they could have done that too Charles yeah Manson. yeah and that's not my discovery that all came out in the 70s when they had congressional hearing the program was exposed in 75 you know right the mk ultra by the church committee yeah yeah and then after the church committee there were two more congressional investigations mm -hmm. and the most important one was something called was called the mk ultra hearings by uh, ted kennedy and daniel inuit oh, wow. senator from hawaii mm -hmm. and they admitted you know that they experimented on citizens without their awareness in prisons right uh in brothels safe houses mm -hmm. um all over the place but they destroyed all their records <laughs> and they claimed amnesia about exactly what had happened and you know it was a lie and, and nobody really ever investigated it that's wild yeah uh, so a lot of them came a lot of the experiments were done in these prisons and manson that's a, a lot of this isn't in my first book, but I'm right now working on the second book. If it, I'm still not sure I'm going to do it. I have to decide whether I want to take that. What's dive. the? Do you, have, do you have a title or anything like no, that? No, no, no. Okay. Because I, ha okay. I, I'm not going to do it unless I get enough really, you know, explosive information. Yeah, 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 I just yeah. don't want to do a second book to, you know, make money. I want to do it only if it's worth the sacrifice you have Absolutely. to make to do it. I understand. So one of the <clears throat> things I'm starting to really get a lot more evidence of is that he was, this stuff began when he was in prison in the yeah. federal system and years they, before he got now, out. In the MK Ultra program, they would, they definitely used LSD yeah. uh, and, and, and uh, electroshock therapy, oh, things yeah. of that nature. So, and the way that he knew how to manipulate his followers <clears throat> seemed very similar to me. Like it, it was mm -hmm. almost like he, took what he learned or what has it had been done to him yeah. or perhaps even taught to him and used it on these people? Or is it something kind of common that all the, no, kind it of wasn't common. Do? I mean, the, the amazing thing was with him is he was barely literate, right? He was out of prison. Um, within six months of his release, he had a group of followers that first year in 67 was probably maximum about 10 or 12 who would do anything he told them to do. Wow including kill people, wow. you know, just because he told them to. Yeah. And a year later, 68 through 69, it grew to about 30 or 40 people. Jeez. And they blind, we were blindly obedient. So um, what I do is I present evidence in my book that he had contacts with people who were working in MKUltra to do exactly that. Their objective was to create people that they could program to kill 
who would have no uh, memory of their being programmed. Right. Like a born identity kind of. Yeah, yeah, or the famous Manchurian, Manchurian candidate. candidate. Yeah, yeah. And um, I don't conclude that, I can say definitively that uh, Manson was a product of it, but I, I think I present a pretty strong circumstantial case that it's more likely he was than wasn't. Right. Hopefully if we get more information right. for the second book. Right. Well, yeah. it's odd too that his one of his followers, Squeaky From, we were talking about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tried to assassinate uh, Gerald Ford in 75. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 extremely odd. It seems yeah, like Yeah, there's lots of strange stuff in this reeks story. reeks of MK Ultra to yeah, me. Yeah. And now I had never I mean you're 37 so you probably hadn't uh, I had never heard of MK I'm Ultra. He's he's 37. Okay. Why you guys had well, you heard of MK Ultra like for the first time how long ago? A couple years yeah, or a yeah. long time? Uh, maybe 15 years and not not back when you 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 actually well, we weren't taught it. about it in school right right right, right. Uh, but you uh, you probably do 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 you remember the the church i mean obviously you were alive. no no i was too young to pay it i mean that but was 75 really yeah. i was 14 i think yeah but um i never heard of it until i started doing this reporting and then i started talking to people who worked at these clinics that manson got medical care at and they hate and they started referencing it and talking to me about it. And I'm like, what is it? I never heard of it before. Right, right. <clears throat> so, um, I mean, that's what it's so, when you talk about it without giving the history of, well, there was congressional hearings, exactly. government admitted they had a program <clears throat> to basically turn people into robotic killers. And it was from 1952 to officially 72 or 73, but who knows? It could still be going on. But right. they said it ended then. Yeah. So, um yeah, it's uh, the, the parallels of what the government was trying to do in the very same time period that Manson became exactly what they were trying to create. Exactly. And able to do it with his followers is pretty stunning, I think. Right. Um, what about, uh, so Susan Atkins, mm -hmm. she's up in, um, and then she's the one that uh, allegedly killed um, Sharon Tate. Um or that she was convicted of it, but I I don't know anymore because I haven't finished your book. So yeah, well the other thing is she changed her story in, exactly. In her first story, she said she stabbed Sharon to death while she was begging for the life of her baby. Right. Later, she said she only held Sharon while Tex stabbed her to death. I mean, the stories have changed so many exactly. times. Exactly. She was definitely there when Sharon was killed. Right. Probably participated. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 She seemed creepy in the interviews. Yeah, she yeah. seemed pretty. Uh, yeah, she died about uh, ten years ago yeah, in was, prison. Yeah, it was like two thousand nine or something. Yeah, right? of a yeah. brain tumor. Uh, cancer, cancer, cancer. Yeah. Um, the uh, what was I going to say? She was a, uh, she was uh, involved with Anton Lavey. Briefly, yeah, she was uh, working as a stripper, and right. uh, she went over to his place and <clears throat> in, in the hate, and I, I think dance naked at parties yeah, was, was, and, in, was in a play or something as a yeah, vampire yeah he would do these these shows um i got to know his daughter uh xena levey wow and her husband I, I have heard they're not no longer together nicholas shrek and um they were both i i could never i used to meet with them a lot in the first yeah. five or ten years you know she was raised in the satanic church yeah she was baptized on a th altar of two naked women who i think the way it was described to me when i saw a picture is they had their hands down and they were yeah it makes and, sense and, and yeah, they, like a table yeah yeah and they baptized zena on that um and uh the levey <laughs> connection uh and then said the satanic stuff that's a rabbit hole yeah. with manson because right. i don't know how whether it was just a weird peripheral thing, yeah. well, but uh, Susan definitely had had history with. Yeah, LeVay. in addition, Levey was the head of the. I know you already know that. Just so you guys out there listening, uh, Anton Levey was the head of the Satanic Church, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what, what I the, think it was called? The Church of Satan. Oh, uh, the Church. Of, yeah, you're right. It was the Church of Satan, and uh, he actually studied criminology and he worked in the crime lab for the San Francisco Police Department. Mm -hmm. So there's a connection to law enforcement there with him, and then he mm -hmm. was also in there with Colonel Michael Aquino. Are you familiar with that guy? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that he was dude, where with Michael Aquino? In he, uh, in the Church of Satan. So okay. uh, you got Michael Aquino. Uh, oh, and they said that LeVay was an informant for Interpol. 
Hmm. Yeah, and this is this is uh, this is me researching. So yeah, I yeah, yeah. No, this isn't anyone. You went I, deeper into I, him I, than I did. Yeah, and then Michael Aquino was a colonel, and I already knew this because I read in Behold a Pale Horse many years ago about Michael Aquino. But he's a colonel in the Army Intelligence Psychological Warfare. Uh huh. And uh, in '73, became the executive officer of the 306 Psychological Operations Battalion at the Presidio up huh. there in San Francisco. Wow. And he ended up getting charged with like 50 fucking like pedophilic charges and and they all obviously disappeared. I was going to say didn't he disappear or something? He may have, I don't know. I this is yeah. all research I haven't I haven't looked at. Yeah, I just read about him in Maury Terry's book um about Manson and the Son of Sam. Right. But uh Could I didn't it, I I tried back on away from stuff that looked like it would take another 30 years to really, you know, yeah. try to get new information right, on. Right, right. I understand. I do, I do, I do. Um, and then um, my question, because you just brought up, um, uh, I, I forgot what you just said right now, but it, it the process. You heard of the- Oh, yeah, I know the process. The process, Church yeah. of the Final Judgment. Yeah, yeah. So what's the connection? Oh, I know, because you brought up Son of Sam, and they were saying that they had connection to the Son of Sam, possibly- well, Terry thought so, yeah. And, yeah. and to the Manson murders. Yeah, yeah. And didn't- uh, one of the people from there was a biker gang, yeah, the Tipsy Jokers, and uh, or the Straight Satan, the Straight Satans, yeah. and was it DiCarlo? Danny DiCarlo. Danny yeah. DiCarlo yeah. was one of the members, yeah. and he provided, um, they provided like security. Manson had like this little security yeah. force for these bikers, and then they in exchange for getting laid, in exchange for all his chicks. You yeah, I'm a smart guy. <laughs> so, um. He was connected to the process, wasn't he? Uh, no, I think you're thinking of Victor Wilde, okay. who was with okay. the Gypsy Jokers. Okay, all right. A rival gang. Right. Uh, he he was involved in the process. And, you know, Ed Sanders, who wrote a book called The Family that came out actually before Helter Skelter, um, he was kind of a, um, a left-wing journalist. He had started a band in the 60s called The Fugs that were kind of, you know, an, an important first kind of psychedelic band mm -hmm. in New York. And he was covering the case for uh, the uh, L.A. Free Press, which was like an underground paper here, and got kind of inserted himself into the group of followers that hadn't been arrested and spent a lot of time with them. And in his book, he wrote a chapter detailing what he claimed was the process's influence on Manson, that they had been connected. He got sued in the United Kingdom, and uh, he, he had to remove that chapter from the book. Um, I have the chapter. You can buy it for a lot of money. I don't think I, I can remember how I got it. Yeah. And I've looked at a lot of the ch the process connections, but again, it's just like LeVay. Uh, they were always around the same place as Manson right, were, right, but I right, could right. never find any exactly. hard evidence that they were actually uh, in any kind of important, significant inter interchange or interaction. Right. Yeah. Right. I'm open-minded to it. But, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I understand. And those people are still around. They have a animal... A shelter or, or a rescue program. I think it's in upstate New York and it's all the original founders who are still alive and their cover to get tax exemption is that they, they do actually really rescue animals, right? but they're still practicing process people Fuck. underground. Yeah. That's wild. The process was a... Uh, you want to explain? You probably know a little better more than I do about exactly... Yeah, that. it just came out of uh, London and came over here about 66, 67. It was a bunch of satanic people who, who did do ritual sacrifice and black masses. And they had a church in the Hate Ashbury District in 67 when Manson was there. Then they right. moved down here. They actually had churches all over the world. They were kind of like Scientologists, but with less money, I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. But they had as, as has devoted followers. Yeah. yeah. Now Manson d actually dabbled in Scientology. Right? A little bit. Yeah. He studied it in prison. You know. And again, that's another thing that uh, is always in dispute whether he had any connection with the church after prison. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Man, really he's all over the place. Right. Huh? Yeah. That's a. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, he's covering a lot of ground, dude. Yeah, yeah. little busy I'm guy. Like, is this one guy we're yeah. talking about? <laughs> five foot six, bro. All five foot six of them. Yeah, Jeez. yeah, amazing. So, and he was in prison for a long time. So, bro, he still had when time he to when do he paroled when he paroled in sixty seven, he had already been in there sixteen years. Correct. Right, right. And then, well, then he went back in, and finally, after the murders, and and died, I think, in twenty sixteen yeah. or seventeen. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask you guys. How did he die? He died of, I think, cancer. Wait, it, cancer or you in know he prison? was in his 80 like 82 okay. but in prison yeah in prison. yeah <clears throat> that's a trip dude 
Yeah. Is that's there, really wild. So the musician, Marilyn Manson, was he like poking pan o to that yeah. or what yeah he was obsessed. embodying that energy yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he's a he was a high priest in uh anton LaVey's church as well <laughs> he probably was no he was was he yeah Marilyn manson is a, is a priest in hmm. the church of satan hmm. yeah. yeah i was telling i didn't know if that was just earlier. for for show for no me. i think what you know i think he's from ohio or pennsylvania yeah. I'll look it up right now and he changed his he took two iconic names from the 60s Marilyn Monroe and Charles Manson and just mm. combine them. And he, I, I was telling you guys earlier, I, I got to meet him because he's very interested in the subject. He invited me to his house. Mm -hmm. And it was like everything you'd expect it to be and more. Mm. Uh, I think I got there at like nine or 10 o'clock and it was maybe seven in the morning when I finally left. Damn. And I told, I brought my collaborator with me and I said, if you don't get me out of this house soon, I'm going to die. <laughs> There's too much crazy stuff going on, Jeez. but I, I loved him. He was great, really mm. smart, really funny. I had no, yeah. I, I mean, I'm not never really listened to his music, but you know, I spent 12 hours with him, almost, and he, I, he was so he, he could be a stand-up comic. He's so quick. Hmm. Yeah, he seems pretty intelligent yeah. in the interviews yeah. and stuff. He seems pretty quick-witted. But yeah, right here it says Marilyn Manson's ties with the Church of Satan have been largely debated. As Rolling Stone has reported, Manson writes in his autobiography that founder Anton Sandor LaVey certified him as a minister in the Church of Satan. Wow, okay. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Well, you feel like you're in a satanic church when you go into his house. He lives <laughs> in one fucking bet. He lives in Bella, Bella Lugosi's old mansion. You know the oh, guy. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, yeah, up in the Hollywood Hills. <clears throat> wow! And there's some creepy stuff hanging from the ceilings in that place. He was on uh, DMX's old albums when mm -hmm. I was young, man. I used to listen to that shit, and I could feel the energy off of that shit. No <laughs> lie. He's got some good fucking songs. Yeah. He, that first, the first album that he put out was really good. Uh. I liked it a Him lot. Him and DMX together, because you know DMX takes it to the dark side, right. too. Yeah, He was touring with some rappers um, when COVID happened. And he, he that's, you know, I met him right after COVID was starting. So last March or April. Oh, this was recent then, huh? He was touring with, yeah, it was just this past spring. Right. And he had he had to stop his tour because of COVID. And he was touring Fuck. with, I forget who the, he was opening for one of the biggest rappers. I forget which one it was. Uh, could probably look it up for us. Yeah. Be crazy if it was DMX. You got it. I feel yeah, like I it was somebody younger. Yeah, you're probably faster than me. Marilyn Manson. I thought you guys were just going to keep talking. That's why. Oh, that's all good. I'm just a <laughs> sideline guy right now. You know, uh -huh. I'm just eating this stuff up. Uh, not like that though. I'm not with all those rituals and stuff. Uh, <laughs> was, it, was it little Uzi Vert? Yeah, yeah. Little there you Uzi go. Vert. Yeah, yeah. Good. Shout out to little Uzi Vert. Tom knows his stuff. Yeah, <laughs> he was one of those young guys. Little, yeah, little Uzi. Yeah. It made sense too. Totally makes sense. But so he he lived in the how. Oh, here's here's his. Uh, so he came out to L. A. When he was a burgeoning musician, just getting a band together and everything. Marilyn Manson. Marilyn Manson mm -hmm. became friends with Trent Reznor from Oh, wow, Nine Inch, Inch Nails. Nails, yeah. So That's Trent right. Reznor and he rented the house where Sharon Tate was killed on oh, Cielo dude. Drive. And that's where they recorded. That's where they recorded that first album? Yeah. So when Marilyn reached out to me the first time, he told me that he had an audio tape that terrified him. And he couldn't talk about it to me on the phone. He wanted me to come and, and listen to it. And he thought it was dangerous for him to have it. And he implied Man. that I, the way he presented it was, I thought it was something he found at the house. Yeah. It didn't matter. I would have gone up. I mean, who's not? Who's going to say no yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. hanging out all night with Marilyn Manson? <laughs> but it turned out to be something that um, he bought uh, online, and he did think he was the only one that had it. It was Roman Polanski's polygraph. But I had wow. it. But it didn't matter. I mean, we still had a great time talking and doing all kinds of illegal stuff. But, um, what, what about the polygraph? Uh, well, P Polanski lied in the polygraph. Wow. And uh, he later said that he was testing it, you know, to see whether it was a Mic check. Check, yeah. check. One, two. Yeah. I'll just make sure this thing was working, man. Mic check. Hey. Hey, yeah. so wait a minute. What, what did he lie about? Just little things. Fucking motherfucker. Uh, he pretended big, not bro. to know people that he knew no. and- I mean, I was supposed to go interview him uh, in the early days of this. You know, he, he, he doesn't talk too often about his wife's murder. Yeah, I bet he doesn't. And um, I had talked to enough of his colleagues and friends and stuff that um, 
his guy who who's like his business partner who produced all his movies since the very beginning till now, a guy named Bronzeberg. He was going to be in Beverly Hills, and he said he would meet with me. And he said, "I'll give you three minutes to make your case for why, wow. why, I, what? Because you can't you can't get to Roman unless I tell Roman to talk to you. You know, Roman can't leave Europe. I mean, he can't come here. There's like three countries you can go to. Yeah, yeah. Right. So he's in Paris and um, was then too. And uh, we were only supposed to have three minutes in the lobby, and I think it went to like an hour, an Shit. hour and a half. And at the end of it all, he said, "Okay, here's the deal. You can talk to him, but not until you're completely done your reporting." Because you only get one shot, it gets them too upset, and it unsettles them for days. So I'll let you, I'll set it up. You obviously have to go over to Paris. And I'm like, that was great because I was still worth a magazine then. It was a magazine story, and they would have had to fly me over and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And he said, but don't do it until you're done your reporting. Um, And don't ask him anything that you can't prove. And he said, you've shown me enough now that he's going to want to hear that. Uh, and I said, okay, not knowing that it was going to be 20 years before I finished. Wow. So when I finally, I actually thought I could go to him in about 2010 or 11, it was too late because I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but he went to a film festival in uh, Switzerland, I think it was, about that time. And the United States Justice Department appealed to the Swiss police, if it was Switzerland, it was one of those countries, to hold him and detain him while they try to get him extradited. Wow. So he was under house arrest for like two months in that country until the country finally said, we're not going to honor the United States um, extradition. Right. But it just brought everything out again. And then he just said he's n- not doing any meeting anymore. So yeah. So I never talked to him. Wow. Man, that's deep. Mm-hmm. That's wild. But he is, I mean, definitely, like, I mean, uh, the husband is typically a person of interest, Yeah, but there's here, so much g- going on over there. My bottom line with him is, just like a lot of these people, I think he knew, knows a lot more about Fuck yeah. how and why things happen than he's ever yeah. admitted to, and uh, that's the kind of stuff I wanted to talk to him about. I mean, I, maybe I could try it again someday, yeah. I don't know. Well, everybody up there knew each other, and they tried, the way it was presented, and it's still presented, is that... It was kind of happenstance. They just accidentally. Well, I mean, I got to give that narrative credit. It was a whole different time in L.A. in the United States in the late '60s. I mean, the hippie thing had kind of exploded in '67, mm-hmm. and the whole thing was nobody is more important than anybody else. No status, right? So all of a sudden, people were letting strangers into their homes, doing drugs, making love with people and everything was free love and free this and i want to see <laughs> <laughs> no that's one thing you know i'll admit it when i was doing this reporting and interviewing these people who were part of that world i'm like god well, i was born in the wrong time <laughs> but who knows i probably would have been one of the people who either followed manson <laughs> or, or was killed by him you know damn but um no it was a whole you know the walls didn't go up gates didn't go up People didn't live with the kind of security. That's so one thing that what Manson you're saying changed. is it's really possible that they could have all been. Yeah, part yeah, of it. yeah, yeah. And yeah. Manson was really good at uh, finding the people that he thought could help him and inserting mm-hmm. himself into yeah, their I lives. You know, that's how he lived at Dennis Wilson's house. Mm-hmm. That's, I was just gonna say that. Uh, and that's you know, it was Wilson really who pro- provided him entree to the whole music scene. Dude, spend a hundred grand up there, dude. <clears throat> hundred grand in the summer. That's like seven hundred. Fifty or seven hundred something yeah. thousand dollars today, dude. Mm-hmm. Hundred grand just mm-hmm. fronted a whole bill, and then uh, dude was scared of him. Dennis Wilson from the Beach Boys, so he just bounced. Right? Isn't that what happened? Yeah, and again, the story that Vince tells isn't true. Um, he, he he did he he rented Will Rogers' house at the end of Pacific uh, Sunset down in Rustic Canyon. Yeah, uh, Palisades. This old kind of I've never seen it. I've only seen photographs. Yeah. And but this amazing house and and Will Rogers was a famous humorist who was probably the most famous man in the world in the 1930s because he had a radio show Mm. and right when radio was taking off and he just like told jokes and talked and interviewed people and also then became a played himself in movies. So Dennis Wilson rented that house and the Manson family who he met a couple of the girls he picked them up hitchhiking. um, They just invaded it when he wasn't there uh and he came back from the recording studio and found like 20 naked women three or four men including manson just partying in his house 
And he was walking up to it, and he, the story is Manson came out and got down on his knees and kissed, and kissed his, feet. his feet and then said, that. come on in, brother. And Wilson just kind of, you know, he was going through some stuff. And uh, he went in and let them stay for a couple of months, and then around August, he'd had enough. I mean, he had spent a fortune on their teeth and medical stuff. and They crashed his they car. They crashed right? a couple of his Rolls Royces or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um so but rather than a victim, he just left the house, let his lease expire, and the landlord, I mean, the owner had to do it. Um, but Bugliosi made it seem like his relationship with Manson ended then, too, but it didn't. Right. Yeah. Right. It continued after, yeah. as did Melcher. Mm-hmm. And so in 67, he paroles, he goes to San Francisco, he comes back down, Um and then we talked about them meeting down here at the Snake Pit. Have you ever even heard of that place down there? Oh, yeah. I'd heard of it just from the books and stuff. Yeah. And people have mentioned it to me. But um, when I started this in 99, it was already gone. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah. It washed away in 68. And I didn't, you know, I, I want to look up, You what was the name of the couple you said? They moved to Montana? Or you don't know their name? Uh, right? Yeah, I believe their last name. Give me, give me a second, brother. I'll look that up. Because I you. didn't know if they were still alive, I should try to find them. Uh, yes, you should. That's a really good idea. Um, but for people who don't know, the snake pit was kind of like a, a crash pad uh, at the bottom of Topanga in the 60s that mm-hmm. you know people just knew that they could show up there and stay there if they needed to. And I guess... Just do lots of drugs and oh, yeah. play music and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and the Manson family. Actually, that's where they went after Dennis, after they had to leave Dennis's house and before Spawn, they were there for at least a month or wow. two. And they'd go in and out of there into that, yeah. to that world. Right. So. Yeah, it's down there. It's off of uh, PCH and Topanga behind the Malibu feed. Bin. Yeah. And what's also interesting <clears throat> is the night of the uh, tape murders, um, what was it? No, excuse me. The La Bianca murders the next night. Manson left them at the La Bianca house and drove away and said, do do what you did last night, but make it cleaner. And uh, they had to hitchhike home hitchhike. after these murders. And uh, so Tex Watson, Leslie Van Houten, and um, Patricia Krenwinkel changed their clothes. They had brought a change of clothes because they were covered in blood and hitchhiked and kind of had a couple different rides and ended up going back behind what's it called the malibu feed barn Mm -hmm. malibu feed not to this uh the um snake pit but there were i think other cottages back there there. yeah and they they spent like a couple hours getting high with some people there who who were later interviewed and said you wouldn't have known that they had just brutally killed two people they were just laughing and enjoying themselves wow like three or four hours after wow that's crazy and what's interesting is uh that place came to be known as the spiral staircase. Yeah. It wasn't back then, mm-hmm. but because the, obviously I think it was a Victorian home Yeah, and it had a spiral staircase. Yeah. And, um, there's a bookstore up here in Topanga now, mm-hmm. uh, called the spiral staircase where right. you and I were talking about that at the end of the fourth and, ray and the end of the seventh ray. Seventh ray yeah. yeah. And what's crazy. And here's the owners, Ralph and Lucy Yaney, Y a N E Y. And Lucy is I E. Cushion Kim Trails exclusive. Yeah. And so they were uh when I looked up and saw what they what they were all about was they were uh psychotherapists mm-hmm. in the sixties and seventies. So, you know, they did a lot of uh experiment I'm not these people in particular, but we know that oh, psychotherapists. Yeah, that's why were I'm using, interested in them. Yeah, now. that we know that they used L S D and different right. things, mescaline. Mm-hmm. And Gary Hinman had a mescaline lab mm-hmm. right uh, down the street. Allegedly, no? Gary had allegedly. It. allegedly, allegedly, I've read allegedly. All, see, I, I know that's one of the stories that Bobby Beausoleil has been telling. Yeah. You know, Bobby yeah. Beausoleil has changed his story every five years about wow. how, the mur- how the murder of him and went down, wow. why it happened, all that. And the latest version is that um, him and was making mescaline, sold mm-hmm. him bad mescaline, uh-huh. and Bobby sold it to or gave it to uh, Danny DeCarlo's bike gang, and they all had horrible trips. Yeah. And they said, oh, yeah, so they paid for it. They said, we want our money back. So Himmans said he went to, to excuse me, Bosele said he went to Himmans to get the money back for yeah. the bad drugs. Uh, and again, you know, I don't know. I know I have the, the police reports and everything, but there's nothing about any drug residue. Wow. There's a scale, but it's like a kitchen scale right, that right, wasn't. Right. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, there's so many mysteries wrapped yeah. up in other mysteries in right, these right. cases. Um, but uh, I've never been convinced that um, him and was doing anything except for sharing drugs. Right. Not even making them, right. just sharing them if he had them. And letting, you know, he let the Manson family stay with him right. uh, off and on for two or three years. When they got arrested, he went and bailed out some of the girls. Wow. Um, you know, he was kind of closeted. He was gay and I think closeted. Wow. And it, the, he was probably in love with Bobby Beausoleil because mm. everybody was. Mm -hmm. And um, but Bobby was taking advantage of him. Um, but, you know, whatever. He, he, you know, they held him for three days, tortured him, and then killed him. It was pretty bad right Man. down the street. Right, right. On uh, 964 Old Topanga Canyon Road. And um, the house is still there. I mean, it looks a yeah, lot different yeah, now. Yeah. It's been remodeled up yeah. front, but the foundation's the same. I went to uh, Bobby Beausoleil's house, too, which mm. is right down the street. And was it an Road. older... Uh, they remodeled it. It's yeah. one, one, one zero eight four four or something like that. Mm -hmm. Horseshoe Drive. It's mm -hmm. the first street you can make a left on. You drive up there, and yeah, I, I went up there. You um, put Bobby on your podcast. Maybe he'll do it. Is he? Is he? He's still. Oh, in, he's in prison. He's yeah, but you can get right? him on the phone. That's true. You can't get him off when you get him on. I used to talk to him a lot. You know what's interesting too, and and this goes to show that those people were all hanging out was uh, Jay Sebring and um, Bobby Beausoleil were in uh, Mondo, Mondo Hollywood yeah. together, but not in the same scenes. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. But it's just like the same, yeah. the same milieu. Yeah, it's yeah. like the fact that all those people are in the same movie about that culture at that time. Yeah, you're like, dude, you guys had to have like yeah. crossed paths, you yeah. know. And so the whole narrative about none of these people knowing each other, yeah. I'm pretty sure they kind of all knew each other. Especially Mama Cass was was you know yeah. knee deep with all those drug dealers, and they mm -hmm. all hung out together. And then she mm -hmm. ended up dying mysteriously. Yeah, in London. Yeah, um, yeah. You'll see it if you go to my Instagram page. I told you earlier I have new stuff that didn't end up in the book. Wow. And I have a, a an what is that Instagram page? There you go. Oh, that's the hard part. I think it's called Chaos Manson. I think you're right. I'm gonna look it up right I now. I always forget it, but I think if you just right. Google Instagram and Manson and Chaos. It's a red thing, yeah. It is. Yep, Chaos Charles Manson. Yeah, Chaos Charles Manson. So what I do is I, um, just to keep people interested and also because I want to constantly keep proving I have what I have, is I began the first year, just, you know, the book's been out almost two years, putting up a lot of the documents that I couldn't reproduce in the book. Then I thought, oh, it'll be fun to have some of my original audio tapes of my interviews with like Bugliosi threatening me, uh, threatening wow. me, Charlie Taco talking about getting Billy Doyle out of the house after he'd been <laughs> raped, that kind of stuff. Oh my God! And then one of the most important finds that we couldn't get into the book because I couldn't nail it down in time uh, for the publication date was that there was what looked like an attempt the night before the tape murders to kill um, the same four people but at a different location. Really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I found a police interview. I got access to a lot of files that nobody had ever seen, including the LAPD murder case on this through a cop who kept kept them. Uh, and there's an interview with Jay Sebring's lawyer's son, who was himself in law school and uh, had put himself through law school and in summers did a, was an electrician. And he had put all the wiring into Jay's house. So Jay lived in a magnificent house, too, on Easton Drive. And it was also considered to be haunted because it's where this either suicide or murder happened. It was a famous uh, producer named Paul Byrne who had just gotten married to an actress. Shit, now I'm blanking on her name. Jean Harlow? It might have, was it Jean? It might have been Jean Harlow. And they found his body. In a pool or something? Something like that, yeah. 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 And then Jay bought that house. Uh, not then, because it was still, he bought it in the early 60s. Right <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, when Jay, and it looks like a castle, and it's at the bottom of Benedict Canyon, Cielo, Sharon, and Roman's house was at the top. And the night before they were killed, August 7th, Sharon, Abigail, Folger, Wojciech, and Jay had dinner at his house. And after dinner, they were sitting down to watch a movie on their TV. And I didn't think, cable was around them but they had just introduced cable wow. in la like the year before and the only people that had it were wealthy people I and i don't know what <clears throat> kind of programming you got but uh they wanted to watch something on cable 
And right before they were going to watch it, at about nine o'clock, there was this huge flash of electricity and lights. And they didn't know what happened, but they lost the cable. So Jay, according to this police interview I found, called up um, his lawyer's son who put the wiring in and said, we want to watch this movie. We lost cable. Can you come over here? And he said, uh, his name was Paul Greenwald. He said to the police, and then he later repeated to me in an interview, he goes, I was just about to leave on a date with this chick that I've been trying to date for like months. And I said, Jay, come on, I can't do it. It's nine o'clock at night. I got I'm already late. And he said, all right, we'll do it another night. So the four of them left and that's all documented in the time. The official timeline is they went to Jay's house, had dinner, were there till about nine or 10 o'clock. Uh, they took Sharon back to the house and then Wojciech and Jay went to the Daisy, one of the clubs or something. Well, the next night, they're all killed at Sharon's house. And right before the murder, Tex Watson climbs up a telephone pole and cuts the phone oh, wires, shit. but not the lights. So <clears throat> on Sunday, Sharon and those guys were killed overnight Friday to Saturday. On Sunday morning, Paul Greenwald, the one who had been called on Thursday by Jay, went to the house because his father, who was Jay's lawyer, said, go get a suit for Jay to be buried in. We need a suit for the right. wake. So he, while he was there... And, you know, then it was locked down. The police were there, and, you know, he had to tell them why he's there and who he was. So they let him in. They interviewed him, and he told them what had happened. Right. And he said, I want to go check out the back. So he went around back, and he found that the lines had been cut to the house. The same way. And he said it, they were severed in a way that you could tell it wasn't chewed through by an animal. It wasn't. It couldn't have been a gardener because it was nine o'clock at night. There were no gardeners. And he said the way that Jay had described it is, he said all of a sudden all the floodlights went on outside. And he goes, that happens because there's, a, I don't understand electricity, but he explains it and it's in the in the Instagram page. There's this massive surge before some of the power goes <clears> out. <throat> and what he thought was they thought they were cutting the phone lines. They cut the cable or something else. And then uh, that caused this surge, and all the the Flood whole lights the whole on. yard lit up. So they ran. So they off. probably ran. Yeah. So, um, Fuck. but the police Botched. the police buried this interview, and the only of reason this did. information came out because it undermined the whole theory for the murders, which was they were strangers to their killers. Exactly. And that's Bugliosi over and over again said that they were only killed because they were in this house. But if this is true, right. And it seems it, it definitely happened. I have the right. paper record. I have the interviews with uh, Greenwald, the kid who went over there. Uh, and I made a video of the, with the interviews and some footage on the Instagram thing where you, it's laid out a little right. bit more coherently than what I've just done. But what it does is it undermines the whole strangers, you know, right. victims of strangers, right. rather they were being stalked. Right. And what's most interesting of all is that one night, Thursday, Manson wasn't at the ranch that night. He was down in San Diego with his new girlfriend. Wow. So it puts the onus, unless, of course, Manson could have told them on the phone call or something. Yeah. But I've always wondered whether Manson ordered these murders or not. Right. So another reason this could have been damaging was if he wasn't even there, maybe it was Watson who was the mastermind of exactly. everything and went over that night before. So we'll never know. Well, hopefully something right. more will Well, Watson emerge. knew the layout to Cielo Drive, too. Yeah. You said that. Oh, in yeah, the yeah, yeah. He'd been there. He'd been there plenty of times. A lot more than, you know, Bugliosi yeah. ever. You guys out there for the official narrative in, uh, that they gave the uh, Bugliosi. Do you not pronounce the G? No. Yeah. If you want to get him really pissed off, pronounce it. Well, he's dead now. Right. But when people call him Bugliosi. Oh, okay. And, and my audio book, the guy that read it, yeah. I was I was horrified when I heard it. He calls them Bugliosi through the whole thing. I'm like, oh my God, we got to do the whole thing over. I was furious. And then I thought, well, you know what? That would have pissed Vince off so much. Yeah. I don't care. Le leave leave it. it. So, yeah. But That's it's Bugliosi, awesome. the G's silent. Yeah. So, his official story is that um, Manson instructed um, Atkins, Susan Atkins. Well, he told Tex Watson mm -hmm. to take these girls up to the house at Cielo mm -hmm. and do something witchy and leave a sign and leave a sign. And that was to intimidate the they, former 
owner. To intimidate Terry Melcher, who used to live there. Terry Melcher, whose mother was Doris Day that yeah. had rejected him on right. a record deal. Right. So that the was Bugliosi's had, yeah. story. Was yeah. He yeah. was so mad about not getting this record deal right. that he slaughtered a bunch of people as opposed to, to just send going, a message. instead of just killing Terry himself. Because he knew where Terry lived. Right. He already had crazy. been there yeah. in Malibu. Yeah. He'd yeah. moved to Malibu yeah. in yeah. January PCH. of that yeah. year. Yeah. So he knew he did. Yeah. And yeah. that's and that's actually in the official narrative that yeah. he knew. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that so, doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And, and then he also wanted to implicate the the official story is he wanted to implicate the Black Panther. Right. In these murders of these fabulously wealthy, famous that whites, Manson wanted to implicate, he them. wanted to make it look like the Panthers did it because this is the helter skelter race war theory. Exactly, he had prophesied to his followers that there was going to be this race world that because you know the blacks would rise up against the whites, wipe out the entire white race on the planet. And then Manson during this time would hide his followers in a secret hole in the desert that he'd found. And then when the race war was over, Manson said, we'll emerge from our hole and we'll dominate the blacks and make them our slaves and we'll repopulate the world with our perfect white children. Mm -hmm. Now, that's I believe that the women who killed for Manson did believe that. For sure. But I know that Manson Fuck didn't, no. and I don't think Tex Watson <clears throat> did. No, Charles, Charles Manson did not believe that because yeah. he's way too slick and he's a career criminal, bro. So he doesn't, there's no way he believes all that and shit. And my biggest regret, in all, I think of all my reporting is, I, you know, I try to do my due diligence and read every interview, see everything. I didn't know when I was talking to Bugliosi that he had once said in an interview in the early 70s, he was asked, do you think Charlie Manson really believed that crazy helter-skelter thing? And Vin said, I don't think he did. He said, I think he got the girls to do it, but I don't right. think he, he was too smart. Now, what that reporter didn't follow up with was, all right, then why did he send them exactly. to that house? What the fuck, dude? I mean, that undermines his whole thing. And right. I didn't know he had said that. Right. And then when I found that out, I found that early interview. And then he, re I found out he repeated it two other times. But, you know, he gave thousands of interviews. Uh, I was kicking myself because each time the reporter didn't ask a follow-up question. Right. If he had ever said that to me, I would have said, then if it wasn't Helter Skelter. Why the fuck did you write the book? Yeah. <laughs> why, why would Manson? Called Helter Skelter. Yeah. Yeah. So. So in so Helter Skelter was the name uh, of, of a book. Beatles song. Oh yeah, Beatles song. Yeah. Um, and supposedly Manson was picking up subliminal messages from this song that gave him that prophecy. Yeah. That, and from the Bible. And okay, the and Testament from the Bible as well. Okay. And, um, or maybe CIA. I don't know. What's interesting though, we t we spoke about this off camera is um, Murphy Ranch. Mm -hmm. behind dennis wilson's yeah, yeah, house tell that, so they, i'd never yeah. heard that before. well they stayed the whole summer there and then if you if you hike about an acre back there's uh 500 concrete steps that have been laid that lead down this uh embankment and down there they have a huge i, I think i i don't know how many acres it is it's huge five thousand five hundred so just like a huge amount of land and um they had uh like a, it was all uh, like a wrought iron security gate which is still there um, there was a uh, huge refrigerator built into the side of this mountain. Um, there was, um, let's see, what else was there? Um, what did the people live in? There was a, there was a home. There was a home like as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. There was a home, and there was a, there was underground tunnels, and all kind. Oh, a generator that they said was big enough to power a small town, uh -huh. and a four hundred thousand gallon uh, reservoir. And the group that was there were Nazis. Yeah, Nazi sympathizers in the United the States. Yeah, in the Pacific Palisades. Do you think Correct. they were Americans or Germans? Or? They were Americans. And but what's interesting is is the prop is the parallels in the two prophecies. Yeah, is yeah because, which I had never heard before. Right, was the owners of this ranch? Uh, the last names uh, escape me. I believe their last names was Stevens or Stephen, but um, Herr Schmidt. Oh no, he was the leader. Yeah, yeah, he was Stevens, the leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then. Um, they ended up calling it Murphy Ranch, though, because they signed the deed under a uh, false name, which mm. I probably a lot easier to do back in the mm -hmm. 30s and 40s than it is now. But um, so to this day, it's called Murphy Ranch. And these guys out there were known as silver shirts, like uh, Hitler had the brown shirts and mm -hmm. whatnot. So these guys, uh, I guess, wore silver shirts and had uh, armbands, mm. uh, Nazi armbands, and they patrolled the, the premises. 
And this guy that ran it, Air Schmidt, who supposedly had some sort of mystical powers and mm. whatever was the leader of this group, kind of sounds like a Manson, um, was uh, said that the Americans and the Germans, because this was during World War II, uh, the, the, the Germans were going to win the war. Or the Americans were going to... I forget who was going to win the war, but it's, it's, it parallels that exactly. Mm. Some One of the side was going to win the war, but wasn't going to know how to lead itself. Right, right. They were going to hide in this hole in the Pacific Palisades, mm. and they were going to rise up, and that they would lead whoever was left on the planet. And do you think... Is there a book about it, or how do you know about this? I looked it up on the internet. Just, I'd love to read a book or see if I just kept, a I just kept looking it up. Murphy Ranch, mm. Murphy Ranch, and whatever could come up, and I just kept going through and going through. Yeah, and, I'm probably going to lose a night tonight because of you because I'll go home and start... <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, I just... When I saw that, and then you're telling me that Buliosi is pretty much full of, full of shit, yeah. that then I get how... He has a cop, and especially how old was he at, in 69? Who, Vince? Yeah. He's the exact same age as uh, Manson, 32, okay. 33. So he probably became a cop in, what, like 57? A DA, you mean. Oh, that's right. My bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he became a deputy DA in, uh, I think, uh, about 63, yeah. 64. Yeah, so I bet, you know, that only being 20 years removed from the public, Yeah, you know, he might have would have. It's possible, I should say, that he had knowledge of that yeah. or, or that what was going on in there. Maybe that was just everyone, kind, not everyone, but maybe it was more known at that time. Yeah. Hey, remember those Nazi sympathizers by the beach? I don't know. Yeah, I you mean, I, I'm really fascinated. Right. Yeah, so yeah. the fact that those stories parallel uh -huh. and that he possibly could have had access to it and then that's where he gets his whole, yeah. you know, because I, I don't know, it just sounded really weird, but, mm -hmm. and also what's out there, oh, it's 50 acres. I have it written down right there. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, There's a, a butcher, 3,000 nut citrus and olive trees. A bunch of leftover buildings and a, a VW bus, a 1960s oh, bus. VW bus, hmm. <laughs> which I was like, yo, yeah, that's yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, the Mansons were right out. there. <laughs> they had to have been like, yeah. I mean, they don't had to have been, but it just makes sense. Yeah. Like who else would have driven a bus back there? Yeah. Yeah. And it makes like, that's a perfect compound for him. Yeah. I got to check this out. Yeah. And you can still go back there. But uh, from what I understand, you know, if the old park rangers catch you back there, uh -oh. you know. <laughs> you get a citation but yeah. yeah you can go down there well that's like the spawn ranch i don't know if you're allowed I, the spawn ranch burnt down actually in the early like 70 71 but you can go down to kind of the bottom of it where there are caves and, and a creek and that's where manson and the girls used to perform and do their orgies and stuff but i've never understood whether that's private property now or not right um <clears throat> It's owned by the church. I know that across the street, the evangelical church. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about the whole Nazi thing is that the adjacent neighbor to the Spawn Ranch in 69 and for five or 10 years before that was a guy named Frank Retz, mm -hmm. who was a Nazi. Wow. Who had uh, left Germany. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how much time in the first or second year I spent trying to get this guy's uh, documentation about how he was able to come over here. Yeah and get settled and become very wealthy and own all this property. And he was actually the one who hired Shorty Shea to drive the Manson family off the Spawn Ranch. Mm. He wanted to buy the Spawn Ranch from George Spawn. Right. Uh, and he had this huge Nazi history that's documented um, and all these connections to, I think, the kind of people that were living at that Murphy Ranch. Wow. And he died uh, in an accident. He and his wife were coming home um, I think it was in the late seventies to their house there and, and right by spawn and went over a little bridge over the Creek Oh shit! and it was flooding. It was, oh, I guess, man. whenever the rainy season is wow. and, he and the, the wife were killed when the car got swept off the bridge. Whoa. Maybe that's how it happened. No. Man. <laughs> I love that part. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Hmm. So let me ask you a question. The first, well, the first recorded murder anyways, is Gary Hinman. Yeah. Okay. And that happened supposedly, the official story, is that he inherited yeah. 20 grand mm -hmm. and Manson wanted it. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. And so what happens after that? Um, the official story is Manson sent Bobby Beausoleil and Mary Bruner and Susan Atkins to get the get the money from Gary mm -hmm. and they got there and Gary said, I don't have any money. I don't know where you got this idea. 
they didn't believe him and they basically held him hostage. Yeah. Uh, I think the second day they called Manson up to come over because uh, they weren't getting anywhere with him. And Manson took out a sword and cut the top half of him and Zero off Shit. and said, show them the money. He kept saying, I don't have it. I don't have it. One of the girls sewed his ear back on. And then um, on the third day, Bobby called up. Um, well, there was a struggle for the gun at one point. And I don't think th- there were shots fired in the house, but nobody got hit. Yeah. And at that point, they tied Gary up. W- we're going to let that happen again. And then Bobby said, we're not getting anywhere. And then Charlie said, well, you know what to do. So they killed him. Damn. And then his body was found two or three or four days after that. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, swarming with flies. It was a August during a heat wave. It was oh, awful. God. Yeah, August up here is hot as hell. Yeah. That's gross. Uh, let me ask you a question. Um Let's see. Uh, when they killed him, they stabbed him? Yeah, they stabbed him, and the girls held a pillow over his face and smothered him. Oh, yeah, and you said in the book he was reciting a... Uh, yeah, a Nishiran Shoshu Buddhist chant. A, pu- a Buddhist chant. Yeah, Tenri. Dude's got a pillow and... over his face, bro. Yeah. Getting stabbed to death reciting a Buddhist chant. Mm. Yeah, it was, according to every... I mean, I talked to a lot of the people who lived here in Topanga and knew him, and everyone said he was the sweetest man in the Fuck, world. Dude. And, you know, people would take advantage of him because he was lonely and generous. Mm-hmm. And, um, he, you know, he was a, a, a musician, yeah, a graduate student at UCLA. And I think just, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, got, was friendly to two, to not to the wrong people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, Bosele actually said he's, he's pretty, he regrets doing that. Oh, yeah, he's... Think he's full of shit? Yeah, when I said you could have him on the podcast, he probably could. I don't know if he's doing interviews now, but uh, he he, he lies so often. It's hard to keep up, you know, and I used to talk to him a lot. And then I just said, Bobby, you're completely contradicting what you told me (laughs) in our last phone call when you said you didn't know this person or that or the other thing. He can't keep up with his own lie. He just wants to get out of prison. And... um, He's been selling child pornography in prison. That he's been called. Yeah, he 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 would have probably been paroled, uh, mm. except he's not been a good student. You oh, know, man. the other ones, Bruce Davis, who's been in prison uh, since 1970 for the murder of Shorty Shea and Hinman, because he drove Bobby, or excuse me, he drove Manson over when Manson cut him in with a right, sword, right. and he was there, so he was an accessory. He got paroled for the seventh time yesterday. Uh, up in Northern California where he's in prison. And each time he gets paroled, or Leslie Van Houten, the only other one who's been uh, voted, you know, uh, paroled, the governor overturns it. Um, And people thought that Newsom, being so liberal, would be the first governor not to. Schwarzenegger did. But, you know, also Jerry Brown, they thought, wouldn't. But none of these guys want that stigma. Yeah. Especially, you know, Jerry Brown probably at one point wanted to run for president. Newsom definitely wants to run for president. So Leslie Van Houten is 70-some years old, and she has a stellar record. I mean, she hasn't gotten one black mark against her. Wasn't even at the Tate House the night before. Right. And was the youngest family member convicted. Uh, But they, even though the board keeps approving her, the governor keeps overturning it. Man, that's wild. So, at this time, now you mentioned in your book that the um, the sheriff's department, LA sheriff's department, out here in Malibu, mm-hmm. was already running surveillance on the spot. Yeah, Ranch. yeah, for a couple months before, before the murders, before the murders. Yeah, and they were and and they had actually went in there and picked them up, hadn't they, on a couple charges, a few prior, charges, yeah, and just were letting them go. Yeah, and they even sometimes they would go in there, and he would tell them to back off. He, he said, "I've got people in the hills with guns pointed." Right, at right. You right just, now. He told the fucking cops that, bro. Yeah, <laughs> they would come check on him, and he would be like, hey, "He had a machine gun, and he had it on the back of his one of his doom buggies, and he found out a clip had fallen off on the road, like Santa Susana or something, and he somehow learned that the sheriffs had it, and he called him up and asked for it back. This is somebody who's on federal parole. You're not allowed to have weapons." Mm-hmm. Let alone live on a ranch Ever with again. underage girls. You're yeah. never allowed to have weapons again. Yeah. Yeah. And that wasn't all he had. You know, he had an arsenal there, yeah. which is what they found when they did their official And they kept raid. letting them go. Yeah. So you met with a judge uh, from the Van Nuys Yeah, yeah, yeah. Courthouse. Louis Watnick, yeah. And, and he was removed from the case. He had nothing to do with it, right? 
Well, yeah, now he had, he had had Manson in front of him on one of these petty charges, but, you know, he only ruled with what the DA gave him. Okay. So he, he let Manson go, But when too. you showed him So the I docket. went to his house. Actually, where are we now? Topanga? It was somewhere around. Not in Topanga, but uh, maybe it was Van Nuys. I forget. Yeah. I get all mixed up over here. Uh, he was retired. He was dying of something. He was on a, a, a what do you call it, respirator and had a real gravelly voice, but luckily my tape recorder caught it. So he was looking at all of my documents I brought that I had gotten from several different places, but the most importantly, I got a bunch of them from the U.S. Um, Bureau of Prisons, mm. his federal parole the file. BOP, yeah. And I showed him the, to Watnick, and he's going through them at one after another, seeing all these times Manson should have been either prosecuted or just had his parole revoked. And right. he goes, you know, sometimes you can just write this off to incompetence, you know, mistakes, pure, you know, we didn't even have computers then. But this, he goes, this is all chicken shit. He goes, this is chicken shit. What do you mean? He goes, somebody wanted him out. Yeah. He said somebody, he was more valuable to someone outside than inside, and they needed to keep him out. And I go, well, who? And he goes, well, that's your job. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I don't even know where to begin. This is my first year. I don't know where to, I'd never even heard of COINTELPRO yet. Right, right, right. And I go, I don't know where to look. And he goes, you look at the FBI, you look at the CIA, you look at the LAPD. He was an informant for someone. Now, a lot of people think an informant means like literally all you do is whisper in a cop's ear about right, it. Right, right, right. But they say <clears throat> it, it's any kind of relationship with law enforcement where you don't even have to give them information sometimes. You just have to provide them access to your own act, anything. Right. You don't know what it is, but you're protected. And he, that's what he was saying. You've got to find out who that was. And I have some theories, but I was never able to prove anything. Right, right. Is that reserved for your next book? No, no, they're in the book. You'll see it towards oh, the end. Oh, they're towards yeah, the yeah, end. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yay. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah. There, but so, I'd rather be able to prove it. I mean, the closest right. I got was not only Watnick, who you know spent his career in not only law enforcement, you know, uh, being a prosecuting, he was a deputy DA, uh, then the DA of Van Nuys, and then a judge. So he knew the rules inside and out. Uh, and what's most important is he knew the time period because that's when he was working. Right. So a lot of times you talk to somebody now and they don't take into account that, oh, this is 69, things were so different. Exactly. Then. So he, and he still said he had to be an <clears throat> informant. And then I got, and this is, I think, towards the end of the book too, one of the, the head of the intelligence at the sheriff's department looked at what I had and he said, this is as far as I'll go. He could have been an informant. He goes, I'll tell you though, if he was, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Yeah. But I will say that it's, it's not unusual to think that he might have done something like I can't remember what, the, right. what his exact words were. So that that felt important to me. What was it that the CIA told you about something? And they there was the one thing that you were like, if you're told that it's it oh yeah, it's of, called a glomer response. It's uh, if they tell you we can neither confirm nor deny that they call it the glomer response because I think it was when the Freedom of Information Act was was uh, passed into law in I think the '60s or '70s. There was a ship, and I could get this all wrong, but I'll try to remember, called the Glomer, which was actually covering as a freighter off the coast of Long Beach, but it was actually an intelligence ship that had some kind of tracking stuff for submarines that they were going to use in the Cold War or something, and it sunk, and then the CIA got caught when they were doing the salvage, when stuff started getting reported, so they... That was the first time they ever said when reporters came to them. It was before the Freedom of Information Act request. It was called the Glomer response that we can neither confirm nor deny we had anything to do right, with that right. boat. And it stuck. So if you ever do a FOIA and you get that, it's as good as them saying, yeah, of course, he has something to do with us, but we're not going to admit it. And that was, that was regarding what? Did they send you that response? I got that for a lot of people, but Reeve Whitson, Jolly West, I mean, three or four people who were the ones that I was zeroing in on right. who were um, involved with the CIA. Wow. That's incredible, dude. So um, let me ask you a question. Uh, didn't, didn't they write... Um, after they kill him and they write political piggy on the wall? Yeah, and they put paw prints. And they put paw prints. And, blood. And, and that's to, to set up the Black Panthers. 
Yeah, yeah, to implicate the Panthers. Okay. Yeah. And was was Charlie really scared of that? Charlie had about a week earlier had shot a uh, a drug dealer, correct? Yeah, yeah African American guy named uh, Bernard Crow. Lots of Papa. He was a big lots guy, of so Papa. Yeah, lots of Papa. Yeah. And and he was he wasn't. Well, was, the official version is he thought that lots of Papa was a Panther. Okay. He was a drug dealer, but. Uh, Charlie thought that he was protected by them or their dealer or something. And he knew that they knew that lots of Papa knew where he lived. So he thought he had killed lots of Papa. He hadn't, he almost did. Lots of Papa was in intensive care for two or three days. Didn't the Manson family take him to the hospital? No. Who took him to the hospital? Uh, I don't know. Okay. never mind. Yeah. There's a lot of, I read. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, um, Manson believed or the story was that he they were about to get invaded by the Panthers so it was another good reason to implicate the Panthers and the tape do you think that's true I don't know I mean that's yeah I you know what he told the cops that he thought that the blacks were going to attack him Hmm. um so then it it does make sense that they're putting all these paw prints and shit like that yeah, yeah okay okay uh so they they do that now um because they're keeping tabs on the ranch, was there uh, Hinman's in jail? If you need a refill on that, by the way, we got that jug right there. Oh, I'm okay now. Okay, yeah. um, him, they, they're they're keeping tabs on the ranch. Hinman's dead. Bosley's. Oh, excuse me. Excuse yeah, me. so Bosley got sorry. arrested Beausoleil's a arrested. week later. Right. Uh, in Hinman's car up near Santa Barbara. Right. Asleep by the highway, so they take him down here to the L.A. County Jail and and, and book him and charge him with uh, the the Hinman murder. So one of the stories is that uh, Manson wanted to commit these murders to free Bobby Beausoleil. By Do you believe that? Doing, no. For a few reasons. N- number one, the most important reason is Manson knew that the police knew that um, Beausoleil had two young women with him because, uh, excuse me, yeah, because him and his friends went to the house looking for him and Atkins answered the door and Bruner and, and they wouldn't let him in. And a couple people called the house looking for right. him and and Atkins or Bruner would say that uh, he was in Denver because somebody with his like a fake died. British accent. Yeah, did you say that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, and um, everybody knew Beausoleil lived at the Spawn Ranch. Linda Kasabian went to visit Beausoleil, and she had to give her ID and or, or her information. They all knew where he had been. Right. So it didn't make any sense for Manson. It would just be more cops on right. them. Except Manson was protected, right? And what I don't can't remember how far along in the book it is, but the two homicide detectives who did the Hinman mm-hmm. murder, it was sheriff's jurisdiction, not right. police. Right. Charlie Gunther and Paul Whiteley. It was right. one of the most frustrating experiences I had because they should have solved it. I mean, they had Bobby in custody. Exactly. They should have gone right to the Spawn Ranch. And look for, they would have found two stolen cars from, from him and they would have found his bagpipes, who knows what else that they had right. stolen. And they could have rounded everybody up and questioned them. And I kept saying, why didn't you go to the spawn ranch? You knew there were two women because they made the mistake of giving me their, all their own notebooks from right. day by day by day. Right. And they said, I, well, first Gunther told me we couldn't go in there without a warrant. Then I went to this woman, Pamela Posh, who was the head of, um, some law enforcement thing in California. And she goes, that's ridiculous. Uh, number one, a judge would give you a warrant because you you had documentation that, that your suspect lived at this place. Right. But number two, it's a horseback. I mean, they rented out horses, so it's open to the public. Right. You could have just gone right in there and talked to people. for no. So every time I would confront uh, Charlie with a little bit more information that he had pulled back rather right. than zeroed in, he kept saying, well, uh, he would give me a different excuse. And then finally, I, I, I developed a relationship with him. I go up to Victorville, which is a long drive, like once a month for like a year. I finally said, Charlie, you're not telling me the truth. You have to tell me the truth. He goes, I'm telling you what I can. I go, what, what oh. do you mean? I mean, he was being very kind of cryptic. And I, you know, so he died. And, you know, I always felt like I was getting this close to getting him to yeah. tell me the truth. But, um, yeah, so the Hinman thing was what kind of began all the stuff that happened. Right. After. So the sheriff's department is watching the Spawn Ranch before 
the Hinman murder. Mm-hmm. Then the murder's committed. Mm-hmm. They know that there's two women there, mm-hmm. and there's there's all these dots basically mm-hmm. that connect, mm-hmm. and they know like, hey man, we could we could mm-hmm. we should go here, but mm-hmm. they don't. Mm-hmm. Okay, then uh, well, they actually had an informant. One of the Manson girls was sharing information with them. Which one? Uh, I can't say for sure, but I think it was Kitty Lutenshire. Okay. Um, and uh, they knew, and this might come later in the book too, they were paying such careful attention to Manson and his activities that I have a, a document dated August 7th. Mm. And it's a report to the head of the division that was conducting the surveillance of the Manson family because they were preparing for the raid. And they said, Manson is in the Bay Area. He's met a new young girl. Oh, right. And they'll be back in Los Angeles tomorrow or today. I can't remember. It's in the book, though, uh, with a a large, like $5,000 worth of narcotics or something. And what's so amazing is he was in the Bay Area. He had just met Stephanie Schramm in... um, What's it called? Where, where uh, the gosh, Big Sur mm. picked her up. How did they know that? Yeah, because he hadn't come back yet. And that's the sheriff's department that has yeah. this information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's wild. Uh, oh no, I'm sorry. They said he's coming back on August eighth. Right, and that's when he came back actually on August seventh to the ranch, and picked up some stuff, and then went to San Diego, like I said earlier. Right, right. Because that's where Stephanie's was from and she was a runaway and she wanted to go home and get clothes. Yeah. So they spent the night, I think in the car or at her sister's house in San Diego and then came back on the eighth. Now, I don't know if he had a lot of drugs. That would be interesting because that could explain stuff too. Right. About the possible drug burn up at Cielo. But the fact that they could track his movements that closely, including up to the day that Sharon was killed meant that, you know, they might've seen them leave, the ranch that night to commit the murder. Exactly. Who knows, you know, exactly. That's, you know, speculative. Yeah, exactly. But it's, it's, yeah, it's not beyond the realm of mm-hmm. uh, reason. Not at all. It makes perfect sense. What do you think about all this brother? See you over there rolling up a fatty. Are <laughs> yeah. you mesmerized? Yeah, man. I'm, <clears throat> it's like a good murder mystery. So, <laughs> right? you know what I mean? I'm just sitting back and just putting the dots together with you guys. It's wild. Yeah, huh? I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative of the work you've put in and, um, congratulations Thank on you. Um, some of the feedback you've probably been getting and the people that um, give you the appreciation it deserves. It's I know nice you... not to be living in a cave, you know, and actually you having people be familiar with uh, some of the stuff. Word. Yeah. Word. Yeah. Was that a relief for you Huge. to get it off? Huge. I mean, yeah, because I never, you know, uh, there's a lot of setbacks. I had uh, one publisher cancel the deal, then they sued mm. me. Uh, I got a lot of bad threats. You know, Bulliosi was threatening me. So there were a lot of times I thought I would never. Didn't Sebring happen. say he was going to throw your suitcase off the Terry Melcher? No, I'm sorry, Terry Sebring's Melcher. Dead. I'm sorry, room. Terry Melcher. Yeah, yeah. I get He's confused. All the names keep going. I, that's hard. You know, one thing I regret is uh, I wanted to put a character chart or list at the beginning of the book. Yeah, and uh, the publisher said because it had already gone a hundred pages too long. Mm. And, you know, they don't want books to be thick because the thicker they are, the less likely they are to sell well. Right. People like 250 pages. My <laughs> book's 550. Yeah. And they said, well, if you do that, then we can't give you more pages for your end notes. And I had to choose. And the end notes are, you know, that's all my sourcing. And they were only giving me 20 pages for end notes. I ended up turning in 120 pages of end notes. Man. And they ended up giving me 60, which I was happy with. But, um, yeah, the names get really confusing. Yeah, yeah. I should. What I should do is make it available online, but uh, I keep meaning to. But there's so many names, it would take me a couple of weeks to get everything together. Um, but maybe I will do that soon. Yeah, man. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> uh, what was I going to say? Okay, so now... And then, so he goes to San Diego, and that's where he stays the night that we were discussing earlier about, about when, possibly when they went to the Sebring residence. When the wires were cut at J. Right. Sebring. Okay, yeah. so that, okay. And then the next night, supposedly, according to the official narrative, he sends uh, uh, Linda Watson? Kasabian, Tex Watson, Susan Atkins, and Patricia Krenwinkel. And Kasabian stays in the car. She stays by the car, yeah. Stays by the car yeah. and ends up turning state's evidence. Yeah. She's like a star witness, right? Yeah, yeah. They wanted to use Atkins first, but... Well, they had Atkins 
They lied to Atkins. They changed her. This is. <coughs> oh yeah, you're probably not at this part yet. No, I did. I got I think about I got... the part where they uh, switched her attorney. Yeah, which is against the law. Right. It would have caused a myth trial if it had come out. When in plus, wasn't there her attorney? Her public defender actually was a DA. Well, she, her original public defender was the one who would have represented her well. Right, right. They secretly had him, the DA had him secretly m- removed with the cooperation of a judge and replaced him with a deputy DA who had left <laughs> like two years before. And then he completely set the whole thing up to fuck uh, Susan Atkins over. Yeah. They got what they needed from her for the grand jury indictments. And then they kind of just left her there because they knew that they ultimately were, were going to get Linda Kasabian who hadn't participated in any of the murders. And Linda Kasabian has never told the truth about what she knows. I mean, I spent two miserable weeks in Tacoma. Well, I'm not supposed to say where she lives. In a a rainy northwestern miserable city in the winter trying to get her to agree to talk to me. I'm in a shitty motel going to her daughter's house because I I still couldn't find out where she lived, but I found out where her daughter lived. Mm -hmm. And the daughter was like a gangbanger who had been in prison and, you know, was uh, Linda... been arrested you know she was supposed to be this little innocent hippie who just got mixed up with the bad people and then she testified and pigtails and stuff she went right out of that case with total immunity uh back to her life of crime yeah. um uh, you know she got they raided her house it was a meth lab she had they had guns they pointed the guns at cops two of her kids were in prison she was not because she still has this agreement Damn. And she's never told the truth about, she lied on the stand about everything. I wouldn't be surprised if she went into the house at Cielo that night. Right. So. And then we talked also about Squeaky Fromm tried to kill. Gerald Ford. Gerald yeah, Ford. Yeah. And then, um, who was it? And before that, her and another member killed a couple, right? Up north. Oh, yeah. Nancy Pittman, uh, Squeaky, and uh, what's that called? Um, was it Stockton? Yeah. Yeah, Stockton. It was uh, the 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 woman was about 19 or her husband was 20 Jesus, bro they and, an and, and and buried the dude right uh they cut off the guy's head Fuck. buried him out in the property and then they took the mother and buried her under the basement floor and had their baby who was i think six months old or less who started she i've talked to her now that she's grown up you talked uh, to the baby yeah yeah yeah. Well, you know she's this was right this no was i know like now early but, 70s yeah right yeah, a lot of these people reach out to me. This actually, I was able to, you know, she found out what I was doing. Yeah. And uh, she felt that, so what happened was um, the guys who actually did the murders were um, Aryan Brotherhood guys who kind of, you know, the women didn't have Manson anymore or Tex. Yeah. So they kind of switched allegiance to these two or three biker Aryan guys. Yeah. So about three or four of the women were kind of committing crimes and moving further north in Cali- Northern California yeah. and killed this couple. I can't remember why they killed them. The couple befriended them. I think it was because they thought they were going to go to the police about drugs or something. Yeah. And um, the women, as far as there were trials, but the women weren't convicted of murder but accessories because they helped bury the two bodies. Yeah. Nancy Pittman, Squeaky, and uh, was it? I can't remember who the third one was. So the women all went to prison. No, actually, Squeaky ended up getting off. They dropped yeah, the charges. Yeah. She walked. Pittman went to prison for like five or six right, exactly. years. Yeah. Uh, and Squeaky, yeah, then went to prison for the attempted assassination. For 34 of years. Right. Yeah, so they got- let her walk, and then she tries to kill the president. That's yeah. what I'm saying. It's weird, right? Yeah. They let her walk from this, that it's like, yo, dude, you yeah. should definitely be in jail. Yeah. You're a member of the Manson family. Yeah. Who knows what you guys have done? Untold carnage, right? You you buried people? Like, what? Mm. That's enough to get you something, and they let her go Man. on a yeah. technicality? Yeah. And then she tries to kill the president? It's a fucking movie, dude. Mm-hmm. It's better than, and the it's movie. the history they don't teach you. <laughs> I, you know what I mean? These are this is shit you got to dig up. Yeah. And as soon as you tell people, they're like, ah, eh, well, whatever. Good thing we dug it up, right? I'm glad you got that book, brother. <laughs> Mr. Tom O'Neill, to man. Yeah. Shoot. Make sure you guys check it out. Pick it up. Oh yeah. <laughs> It'll be the best twenty bucks you ever spent in your life. National bestseller right here. It's Tom O'Neill oh, with Cushy two L's. Kim <laughs> oh, two yeah. L's. Yeah. Double L. Yeah. All right. Get it so, right. Chaos right. Anyways, they, the book. They, Chaos. they go to the house. It's Sharon Tate, Abigail Folger, Frykowski, and Jay, Sebring. Yeah. Okay. And, and then in the back house, Steve Parent, Steve was Parent. leaving. Uh, he's the first one to get killed. Bro, he, what's up with that guy, the, the caretaker? Garrison, yeah. 
What's that about? 60 feet away? Yeah. He, he, and he doesn't hear any shots. Yeah, There's but, a bunch of shots and carnage. Well, that's not, yeah, yeah. I mean, the frustrating thing, I, I was one of the first people to ever interview him. Wow. So he was a kid who was living in the guest house behind the house where the murders happened, mm -hmm. 60 feet from the house. So this massacre happens of four adults who are screaming, getting shot, getting bludgeoned, getting stabbed to death. Uh, Patricia Krenwinkel was killed right outside his window. Right. And one of the things I looked into was the police reports, and, and um, I interviewed Rudy Altabelli, who owned the property. I said, was that guest house air conditioned? He said, oh, no, no, we didn't have any air conditioning in either house. So I'm like, so his windows were open because they were in a heat wave. It was a yeah. massive heat wave. And he claimed he didn't hear anything right. right outside his window. Right. He was arrested the next morning and taken in and held for three days. And all this stuff isn't in my book. And it would take me two hours. But I believe he was part of, um, he, he was, they played with his head. Fuck yeah. Yeah. And erased it. So he agrees to talk to me for the first time, talking to a journalist in like 1999 or 2000, the first year I did this. And he tells me that, uh, he now remembers hearing the noises and he said i knew what was happening and i wrote everything in these letters i had written and that was his alibi he said he was busy writing letters all night and didn't hear anything and i said whatever happened to the letters he goes i don't know they would never give them back to me they were taken and sure enough i talked to the cops and they said yeah we had to get a search warrant for them they go because they're male they're federal property yeah I go, what was in them and every cop said well i never saw them i go where are they are they in the app no they disappeared everything disappeared bro so then garrison i I'm developed this phone where he's in ohio i talked to him two three four times all of a sudden he's adding to his story ah oh, you know i remember because he had hitchhiked down from sunset he got dinner and came back well now he's telling me that he got picked up by four hippies in a van who told him to stay in his house that night and not come out i'm like well bill why didn't you tell me this because i'm just remembering stuff right then the story turns into um well there's a woman who shows up in my life and in, in this crazy scene in like 2001 who claims to be the baby who was cut out of Sharon Tate's womb and hidden by the government and grown up. So her name is, Ro she changed her name legally to Rosie Tate Polanski. She was born, I mean, she's that age. Uh, I could never get her birth certificate, but she's clearly mentally ill. Wait, is that Rosemary's baby? That's good. I never even made that I connection. I was just going to say that, No, bro. wait, I didn't make that connection. This guy did. But yeah. you said it. Yeah. Or, you, or you already know about her. No, I didn't know about the the baby, but we were we, we we were talking about that angle with the movie. Yeah, but I never occurred to me that maybe she named herself Rose. I mean, I'm, her name probably is Rosemary. Yeah. She calls herself Rose. I was going to ask you. I was going to say, is her name Rosemary? Like Rosemary's baby. I don't want everyone to talk to her again because she became like a stalker. Yeah. And that. she bothered uh, Deborah Tate, Sharon's sister. Yeah. She was writing letters to Pol She was completely convinced. As it turns out, she really was Patty Duke's niece. Now, Patty Duke, you got you, you might be too young, but I think you yeah. know Patty Duke. Yeah. She was one of the most popular child stars. She won an Oscar for The Miracle Worker, a movie where she played Helen Keller, and then she had a popular TV show called The Patty Duke Show. She and Sharon were very close, and this girl was actually her niece in real life. So she finds Bill Garrison in Ohio after trying to get me to tell her story mm -hmm. and other people, and we all wrote her off. Garrison gets engaged to her. Wow. And she convinces Garrison that she really was the baby, and now Garrison's calling me saying, you know what, these men in black came to my house with little Rosie, who's now my fiance, and they brought her in there and, and Patty Duke and Frank Sinatra drove over and took the baby away and Patty Duke raised her and it was a secret. Uh, and Bill Garrison's mother, he's you know a 60, 70 year old, three times divorced man at that point. She starts calling me and saying, you've got to talk Bill out of marrying Rosie. She's insane. She's moved into the house. They would have all these Sharon Tate nights where they would watch Sharon Tate movies. And I go, I talk to him. I go, I can't change his mind. Luckily, he died of a heart attack or something. And she disappeared. And nobody's heard from her for a yeah. few years.
So yeah, yeah. It, this I mean, this isn't in the book. It's too crazy. But the whole Garrison angle is something that will be in the second book because I did find out a lot of fascinating stuff about him and what was going on at that guest house right before yeah. the murders. So they go in there, they slaughter him, mm-hmm. and they leave from there. And uh, Kasabian's outside. She's driving. She was again. This is <clears throat> Bulliosi said she was the only one with a driver's license, so she drove. But she wasn't the only one with the driver's right. license. Um, but she was in the car. She, I think Watson drove. Then she was told to watch, to, to, to stand by the car and make sure nobody came up the driveway. Right. Um, let's see. What was I going to ask you? There was something else about... The night of the murders or... Hmm. All right. So they leave from there. They go back to Spawn Ranch. Uh, no, that's the night they go back to, or was it after the LaBiancas that they go to? The yeah, after pit? the yeah after the LaBiancas, um, Charlie, Charlie dropped off Tex and Leslie and Patricia at the LaBiancas. Then he and Linda, right, and Susan Atkins left and went to Venice. And the official story is Manson tried to get them to go and kill this out of work actor. Wow. Who lived at Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and Kasabian took him to the wrong house. Yeah, and I think that Bulliosi made that story up so he could say that Kasabian was ordered to kill by Manson and she wouldn't do it. Right. Because he needed to clean her up and make her presentable to the jury. For sure. Yeah. And I think that a lot of uh I mean her her Kasabian's lawyer basically told me and it's in the book that uh that she was his own client was lying up there on the stand just tell, doing whatever Bugliosi told her. He told her he said if you don't say that you heard Charlie tell them to go up there and kill everybody in Terry Melcher's house, you're not getting you'll end up in prison. Right. He said I'm not telling you he goes if you heard it or didn't hear it, I don't know, but you have to say that you heard it. And she was like, "All yeah. right." Yeah. She did it. <laughs> yeah. Obviously. Mm-hmm. All right. So there was also a group of drug dealers. Mm. Billy Doyle Charles and Taco and another guy for uh, Billy Doyle, Charles Taco, uh, uh, Tom Harrigan and Pick Dawson. And three of them were like ex-boyfriends or on and off boyfriends of Mama Cass. Elliot. Right. Right. And, you know, poor Mama Cass was um, really addicted to drugs then. And the mamas and the papas had fallen apart. She actually was really talented and she he did a solo record it was a she said a couple of hit songs but she couldn't keep her act together and she had these guys living with her who kept supplying her with drugs right um so that's those, where that phrase comes from which one get your act together <laughs> <laughs> maybe yeah Jeez. but um, um yeah so they were uh so sharon and roman both left hollywood in March, February or March of 69, okay. Roman to go to London and, and work on what he was going to direct the movie version of Day of the Dolphin. And Sharon went to Italy to make a movie. Um, so while they were gone, they let Abigail Folger and Wojciech stay in the house and kind of house it for him. So then Sharon had to come back to have her baby because she didn't, for whatever reason, she didn't want to have it over there. Right. And she couldn't fly because she was too pregnant and she took a, a ocean liner back Holy shit. but i guess she took a domestic flight i've always wondered about that but anyway so she got back in mid-july and then roman kept putting off his arrival yeah um and she was stuck living with abigail and Wojciech, yeah. and she didn't like them I think she liked Abigail a lot, but Wojciech was a mess, and he had this awful crowd up there every day. Billy Doyle, Charles Taco, all those guys. And not only were they, you know, doing lots of uh, drugs, but they were violent and fighting. In, and, in, Sharon in Sharon's in, house. In Roman Polanski's house. Yeah. So Sharon's calling up Roman and begging him to come back and to get them out of the and house. And she's like eight months, eight and a half months yeah, pregnant at yeah, this time. and he wouldn't do it. Wow. He wouldn't come back. See, and yeah. that's what always interested me about his angle in the whole thing. But real quick, so there was all kinds of weird shit that they said was going on up there anyways. Yeah. And one of the interesting things that I had I had researched and I found this was that, uh, and I, I think it's in your book as well, is that, uh, well, I saw that Dennis Hopper said it. You don't say that in your book. I think you, and I'm only saying that because I don't want to 
if it's speculative. I can't even rem- I know that Dennis Hopper said it in an interview. Okay, yeah, okay. I can't remember if I had heard it. I got it from the police reports because all of their crowd was telling them this Billy Doyle story. What, what but happened? Dennis Hopper was, I think, the only one that said it to and, a reporter. And they felt like that could be retribution for yeah. that the killings at the Sharon Tate. Well, here's the interesting thing. Bully Osi doesn't even mention the rape in right. Helter Skelter. What he does is he gives those four guys aliases, pseudonyms. Right. Uh, when Helter Skelter came out in 74 or 5 or whatever. I guess they were alive and yeah. he was scared they were because. He, he says they were, well, they were suspects. Their names were in the papers. What he said happened, and this did happen, was when Sharon and Roma moved into the house in January, they had a housewarming party. And again, it's open door policy. So uh, Billy Doyle, Charles Taco, the four guys I mentioned, went to the party with um, Cass, Mama mm-hmm. Cass. Mm-hmm. And, you know, two of them were living with her at the time. And at the party, one of them, Doyle, I think, stepped on Bill Tennant's foot, who was Roman's manager, and they got in an altercation, and Roman threw them out, and Doyle said, we're going to come back and kill everybody. Oh, wow. That was in January or February. Um, that was why they were the original suspects okay. in, in the official Helter Skelter version, but in real life, there was a much more recent incident which happened um, when Sharon was back, but not Roman yet, in July, late July, mid-July, uh, Billy was allegedly drugged by Jay Sebring and Wojciech. Who? Okay, so the two two of the guys that were killed... Drugged Billy. So allegedly drugged? And one of them anally raped him. Wow. Uh, and then uh, they called up Charles Taco, who was his partner, and did you see police reports that actually yeah. said? Oh, oh, yeah. so, oh, so this has been verified. Oh, yeah, this is verified. Yeah. Oh, so not allegedly. Yeah, I think it's in Ned Sanders' book. Bullios never mentioned So that. Jay Sebring yeah. and Frykowski, yeah. two of the victims, had raped yeah. uh, well, a drug dealer, a, a Billy. Drug dealer yeah. Billy Doyle. Wow. Yeah, so Taco drove up there, and it's on my Instagram page. This is from my audio interview of him in 2000. He tells me what he told the police. He said he got a call from... Uh, I think Wojciech saying, please come and get Billy before he's passed out at the house. You got to get him out of here. He's going to kill us when he wakes up. So Charlie went up there and carried uh, Billy into his car. And he drove him to Mama Cass's house where he was living. Both of them were living. And he chained him. And he tells me this in the interview. He goes, so I took the, I had chains uh, uh, just for this kind of thing in my trunk. I go, what do you mean you carry chains? He goes, it was part of my business. You wow. know? So he chained him to Mama Cass's tree uh, so that when Billy did wake up, he wouldn't go kill them. And I said, well, did was he raped by those two men? He goes, well, all I can t- say is his pants were split down the back. Yeah, I think so, something like Damn. that. Uh, and... Um, then so Billy was screaming that he was going to go up and kill everybody. Charlie in, in in the tape you'll hear this. I don't know if this is in the book. I can't remember. He calls up his father, who's an ex-military guy, and Billy really respected and told Billy he couldn't go up there and kill anybody because nothing good was going to come of that right. to leave the country. So Charlie took Billy out of the country to Jamaica, and then the murders happened. And I'm not convinced that they weren't back when the murders happened. Yeah. Um. Wow. So there was, let me ask you, you said Sharon Tate was back at that time. Was she back? Yeah. Did she, did she witness that? I don't, did? all I know, uh, yeah, the little information. Well, I doubt she was running around town eight and a half no, months pregnant. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, actually, it was amazing because I do have a pretty good timeline for her. I don't know the, I only have it narrowed down to the week that it happened, not the day. Yeah. But I have a timeline for her and she was almost every day either having friends up for lunch or going to friends' houses. They had actually went out that day, huh? They all went out to... They went to... Well, again, that's something I've always wondered about, but the official version is they went to um, El Coyote, the Mexican place yeah, uh-huh. on Beverly. Wow. Uh, and then went back. Shout out to El Coyote. <laughs> Are they still out there? They're still there, yeah. All their right, food, El Coyote. Their food sucks, but the yeah. margaritas are amazing. Lock your doors before you leave. And <laughs> turn the lights on and check your house when you get back. Mm-hmm. I hope they survive this because I actually love the place. I just never go there expecting good food. Yeah. Well, so what's interesting, so man, they were on some weird shit is, okay, have you heard that um, Sharon Tate was a white witch? Yeah, I've heard that. No idea if it's true. I, You know, it was 1968, 69. She was in 
her last movie was called The 13 Chairs, and yeah. it's about witchcraft and all right. that. I think she probably... In Italy, it's called 12 plus 1, right? Yeah. So yeah. 13. Yeah. There's that number again. Yeah. Wait, where was it before? What, oh, no, 13 is like, they always use it in like... Oh, yeah, so yeah, it's a yeah, bad, yeah. Yeah. They don't have the 13th floor in elevators. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but no, so, uh, I mean, I wouldn't be at all surprised if she, you know, had these little weird... Yeah. Well, know. the death card, like in tarot, is mm-hmm. 13. Mm-hmm. And the number 13 in numerology, mm-hmm. you'll just see it pop up with a lot yeah, of the yeah. esoteric shit. It yeah. pops up all the time. So, but anyways, yeah. Um, yeah, and then, um, let's see. Yeah, and then that that what you brought up, the Rosemary's baby. Mm, I always yeah. thought that was weird. So Well, yeah, that well that was what everybody's initial response was when we when we I was 9 years old. When the what was reported that, you know, the morning that the bodies were found, number 1 there were all these rumors that they were all hooded, that there was satanic markings left, that there was it was ritualistic with black right. candles. So Rosemary's baby had come out one year before, right? Fourteen months, and you know, and Roman Polanski uh, directed that. You guys, it's a movie about a woman who's pregnant with the devil's child, Continue. and it's a great movie. Yeah. It is actually really good. Yeah, Mia Farrow plays um, uh, actor, or the wife of an actor, John Cassavetes, in in the Dakota building where John Lennon lived and died. They're living there, and John Cassavetes, her husband, makes a deal with the devil's cult that live in the building to allow Satan to impregnate um, his wife in exchange for him getting an acting career because he couldn't get hired anywhere. <laughs> and um, it, it's a go. I mean, it's a, it's a thriller. And at the end, I don't want to spoil it, but she has the baby and it's a pretty scary ending. So then a year later, poor Sharon Tate, eight and a half months pregnant, is killed in her house and the first reports are that it mimicked the scene of Rosemary's baby. Exactly. So the first rumors uh, um, that kind of spread like wildfire was that this was some kind of a consequence of Rosemary's baby or some kind of a result, either satanic people getting back at Polanski or maybe they were all satanic too. And yeah. you know things went crazy. But the problem was that they, they weren't hooded uh, there, there was a handkerchief that was over Jay's face, um, and there was nothing there resembling black the black arts right. or anything. So. You know what kind of led me to uh, think too about the Polanski angle, as far as being like, like it seems okay. Jay Sebring and Sharon Tate already dated, and then they were <clears> hanging out a lot, and he was never around. So, and then weren't they weren't they uh, tied together too by yeah. the neck? Um, yeah wait no abigail and sharon were tied by the neck and the rope was thrown over the rafter maybe the rope around jay's feet was tied to them too or something yeah because when he fell remember and i think in your no for sure in your book Mm -hmm. you said that they had to go up on their tippy toes yeah oh you're right 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 yeah yeah. so he was tied too so i thought that was odd but what's his name made a dash for it and was like really putting up a fight so he he probably would have been tied up too had he not well, that's the weird thing. They, you know, they brought tons of rope, and according to the official version, Tex told uh, Susan to tie Wojciech's wrists with a towel. I mean, how can you make a secure knot with a, a bath right. towel? Right. And they had all that rope there. Again, there's so many holes in even the official minute by minute account of the murderers. When they finally admitted to it, they kept changing their versions and stuff. Yeah, that's why uh, a lot of the theories that I've had, I've had to like change them over and over because I'm like, as I started reading your book, yeah, there were so many holes. I was just like, oh, wait a minute, dude! Like, this changes everything at this point, and it really does. Uh, let's see, there was something here I wanted to talk about. Um, yeah, so what what was the trip was? <clears throat> then I looked up. So you have the Rosemary's Baby angle, right? So you're looking, okay. So then I'm like, okay. They kill a baby, and now with this new story you told me, supposedly they killed a baby, right? Because mm-hmm. now you're telling me some ladies running around saying she is the baby. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. so anyways, they killed the baby. She what? Well, it wasn't didn't die. Actually, from sta- the baby didn't die from a stab, stab wounds. Wound. Yeah, it suffocated, it was suffocated right? Yeah. Okay. And supposedly, if they had gotten there six hours or three hours earlier, they might have been able to save the wow. baby. Yeah. Wow. So the the uh, the next night though. When they killed the La Biancas, they kill a woman named Rosemary. 
Mm, oh, now you're going to make... Yeah, and that that's is. what freaked me out. I'm like, well, wait a minute. They had a baby the one night. The next night, they kill a woman named Rosemary yeah. for no reason. And yeah. he swears up and down that, hey, man, uh, I stayed next door at some pad. Charles Manson says yeah, that yeah, that's how they found that house yeah. in Los Feliz, right? Yeah. No, I don't, I don't think that's true. No, I mean, not at all. Well, here's, story, here's yeah. an angle that I never uh, saw anyways investigated was at the time they had a... Well, uh, Leno... Uh, was the stepdad, but the woman, uh, Rosemary, yeah. Oh, no, a, oh, the wife or daughter? Yeah, the daughter, yeah. Susan. Yeah. Uh, she was 21. Yeah. So she's the same age as all, like, Susan Atkins and all of them. So just like how they got to uh, Gerritsen or whatever. Yeah, but I don't think, because I, I know her, Susan. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people, so what happened with, all right, so Lino and Rosemary are murdered overnight, um, Saturday to Sunday. Yeah. And then Sunday afternoon, um, Frank Struthers, who was another a stepbrother. Uh, well, that's the, the younger Rose, brother, right? Yeah, yeah. He's like 14. He's dropped off at the house by his friends. He'd been away for the weekend up in mm -hmm. the mountains. And he senses something's wrong because of the boats out in the, drive, uh, out in the street. Normally, Leno has it in the driveway. The shades are all drawn. They usually didn't have them drawn. Yeah. So he senses something's <clears throat> wrong, and he walks to a hamburger stand, calls up his sister, Susan. Susan comes and picks him up with her boyfriend, Joe, mm -hmm. Dorgan, and the three of them go to the house. Frank stays outside. Susan and Joe go in, and they see Lino's body, you know, with war carved into the stomach, a fork in his throat. No, a knife in the throat, a fork here. So they, they carved the word war in war his stomach, in his stomach, right? Yeah. And then they, they stabbed him in the throat, you said, with a fork? Well, he was stabbed a lot, but they right. left one They left one implement in the throat and one in a, a, a fork. No, a knife here and a fork here, I Holy think it shit. was. A carving fork. So um, they went running out, called the police. So jump ahead to the earlier mid-90s. Tex Watson's up for parole. Yeah. And that's Susan, what tripped me out, bro. Susan goes to the parole hearing. And she had been visiting him, too. And says she believes, she's a Christian, a born-again Christian. And, and so is she he. believes that he has genuinely committed his Fuck life that. to Christ. So she testifies on his behalf. Now, I didn't, she doesn't give interviews. Right. And she never did, even before that or after that. Um, I found her about five years ago because I needed her to go to Tex and ask for something which is at the end of the book. Um, I start talking to her on the phone and she decides that she'll do it. But I wanted to know, because I knew there were all these rumors that she might have been involved with the family, set her parents up or something. Yeah. Didn't and, she steal inheritance too? Well, that's it. Bugliosi wrote in Helter Skelter that there was a one or $2 million inheritance that Rosemary had that would have gone right to her two kids. Lino had all these other kids, but... yeah. I got Rosemary's, um, uh, what do you call it, will and paper. She didn't have that much money. Mm. I don't know where Bugliosi got that. Again, I question everything, though. But, um, no, she went off, got married, had kids, and never really recovered and became a born-again Christian, genuinely. And what she told me was, in my mind, Charles Manson didn't kill my parents. Tex Watson was the one who killed it. And I was reading about him, and... I saw that he claimed that he had been saved. I had been recently saved, and I, for my own reasons, wanted to look him in the eye and see if he was really serious. So I went to, she went to visit him without telling him who she was. Mm -hmm. She just started writing him and saying she was interested. Right. He agreed to meet her, and the story she told me was when she finally told him who she was, they both started crying so the daughter of rosemary labianca who was brutally murdered by tex watson mm -hmm. 21 years earlier 20 mm -hmm. years earlier yeah. friend, she, she's visiting him okay so uh she decides that she's going she's she, she, she said to me she goes in my faith you, you know you believe in god's forgiveness and I truly believed he was saved, and that was the next thing I needed to do. She goes, I never should have done it because it ruined my life. Because ever since then, everybody thought she had to have been involved with this. Right. She got chased out of neighborhoods, harassed. Well, when I talked to her, she, she said, I will go see him to ask him for what you want. But just so you know, I haven't had any communication with him for about 
I think 10 years. I go, what happened? And she goes, I really don't want to get into it, but let me just tell you that he's not the man I thought he was. Damn. So she finally decided he wasn't, in fact, yeah. saved. Yeah. Um, so. He's up there in Mule Creek, right? He was. I think he's been moved someplace else. I can't remember. But um, here's the horrible coda. Her daughter, Susan. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know about that. Yeah, yeah. Almost 51 years to the day. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I got murdered. And uh, so the daughter of Rosemary LaBianca. I think it was her daughter. Yeah. Is stabbed to death. Yeah. Uh, in Denver. Yeah. And, and that daughter's sister. So I had written to Susan or called her before the book came out, which was 2019. And I told her I wouldn't put her in it. And I didn't. Cause, yeah. Yeah. Uh, You'll find out at the end of the book. I think you'll figure out why she's not in there. No, nothing sinister. Just I didn't. She didn't need to go to text to get what right, I needed. Right. Even though she was going to do it, and then she, I told her not to. Um, but um, I think I sent her the book. I just wanted her to have it to know what was happening. And she wrote me, emailed me like six months later, and then about a year later, or a little less. I think it was last summer um oh you said it was a 51 anniversary right around then yeah yeah so her, her daughter got killed and i didn't you know she's so private i didn't i, I should have reached out to her but about a month after her daughter got killed her other daughter the girl's sister called i know emailed me mm -hmm. and said she needed my help there was a lot of stuff that wasn't coming out about this or something and she wanted to talk to me and i said okay uh I, I should have, I told her, I, I wrote her back. I said, I'm happy to help you. And please tell your mother I'm thinking about her. I, I didn't want to call her or anything after it happened. And then I never heard from her again. So I don't know. I mean, I might reach out to her once more, but this was probably September. So uh, yeah, that family's had it rough. Man. Yeah. That's wild. So I, you know, so I looked into the possibility and I mean, I could never say a hundred percent sure, but I'm, I, I'm pretty convinced that, um, uh, I, I don't think that Lino and Rosemary were strangers to Manson. Uh, I don't think Susan, I mean, she hadn't been living there for a couple of years. Right, right. Uh, and I know Joe, Joe Dorgan, the rumors, if you Google it, uh, the, the guy who was her boyfriend or brought her there, they say he was part of the Satans, straight Satans. Mm -hmm. He wasn't. He had a motorcycle for recreation. Right. Um, I've talked to him a lot. Uh, and I talked to Frank even, who died a couple of years ago. But... Um, Believe me, it would have made my book much sexier if, if that were the truth. And there's oftentimes I thought, well, I wish, but I really think that, uh, I mean, I got to, I, I was talking to her for hours for like a year and a half. And I really felt, uh, I, I would ask her questions. I would have been able to catch her. Yeah. And her, her, she was consumed by number one regret for ever befriending Watson for the two reasons. One, cause it ruined her life. And then second, she realized she, he had deceived her. Right. Right. So. Well, um, so that was the night after. Mm -hmm. So it was August 9th and yeah. then August 10th, right? Well, the bodies were found on the, they were killed over. So Sharon and her crew were killed overnight from the 8th to the 9th. Mm -hmm. The LaBiancas were killed overnight from the 9th to the 10th. And the bodies were found in the evening of the 10th, a Sunday night at like 8 or 9 o'clock. Okay. And so Manson drives up, drops them off. Dro drops them off. And then he and Sadie. And, and that one is who? Pardon me? And and who who's the crew on that one? The killers. It's Watson. inside the house is Watson, Leslie Van Houten, and Patricia Krenwinkel. So Tex and Patricia killed the night before right. and then the second night, but with the addition of a new person, Leslie. Okay. And then Charlie and And, and Leslie's Leslie's still incarcerated to this day, correct? Yeah, yeah. She's been um the parole board has approved her parole, I think, four or five times. And they every time it gets to the governor's desk in most recently yeah. news them like a, six months ago. I think she's up for parole. See, now that they're at such an age, I think they get parole hearings once a year. Yeah. In the beginning it was once like every five years. Yeah. But now that they've been in so long and they're so old. I mean, I think I read that she has COVID like a week or two ago. Holy shit! Yeah, and I, I talked to her, talked to her, email her, her lawyer a lot because he's trying to help me with this stuff that we wanted Susan to get um, from from Tex. Yeah, uh, and he's working really hard to get her out. 
out of uh, uh, parole, and now especially with the COVID thing. But I don't. Watson's never going to get out. Uh, he's never been approved. Um, the only ones who have been approved are Leslie and um, Bruce Davis. Wow. Patricia Krenwinkel, actually, she has a stellar record too. Why is Bruce Davis even in jail? I haven't even heard his name. And was it something else? Yeah, he killed Shorty Shea. Oh, he helped with Shea. He was one of the three or four guys that did that, right. and then he was an accessory in Hinman. Right. Um, so they 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 go inside um, the La Bianca's. La Bianca's, and didn't Manson go in there first and tie him up? Well, that's another one of the weird riddles of the case. The official <clears throat> story that Linda told and was told at the trial was Manson went into the house alone, mm-hmm. tied up the two of them, then came out, went back to the car, and told Tex to go in uh, with the two. He picked out the two women and told the women to do whatever Tex told them to do. Yeah. Now, number one... The newspaper guy, so Lino and Rosemary had driven back from their mountain. They were uh, visiting uh, a friend of Frank's at a lake in the mountains. They drove back that night, and they were listening to the coverage of the tape murders all day on the, on the on the radio, in the car radio. And then they, before they went to the house, uh, Lino would always pick up a paper in a racing form. So they go at like 11 o'clock to the newsstand in Los Viles, and the news guy said that Rosemary said to him, I can't, I'm not going to be, I, I've heard about this already. I can't look at the, the, she was so horrified. About the tape murders. About the murders that happened <clears throat> the night before. So they go back to their house. How does Manson get into the house? Lino's got guns, like he had an arsenal. Yeah. Why was, you know, how did he tie up two adults yeah. if he didn't have a weapon? There were all these things that didn't make sense. Later, Tex then started, when he finally wrote his book, he said he went in with Charlie. Mm, that makes more sense. Yeah. For sure. But then that would mean Linda, who told the official version, was lying, which makes sense to me. Yeah, absolutely. But what was the point? I don't know. I, I, you can't yeah, overthink yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of this. So yeah, so the, the short answer to your question is they were tied up and then Charlie left and then Rosemary was brought into her bedroom by the two women Lino and Tex were in the living room, and then Tex just started stabbing Lino to death. Damn. And Rosemary heard him screaming, and they had tied her up with, um, uh, again, why, why didn't they have rope that night? I don't know. They knew what they were going to do. Right, right, right. So they had to tie her up with an electrical cord from a lamp, and they did put a pillowcase over her head. She heard her husband being killed so oh. she got up and started swinging the lamp around her head she couldn't see to yeah. try to hit them and, and get and she struggled and patricia started stabbing her to death Damn. and then tex came in and started stabbing and then he told leslie that she had to participate probably rosemary was already dead when leslie stabbed her yeah um but she admitted that she stabbed her another. It was forty six times, right? Yeah, and I think and this, Leslie stabbed her like twenty. And it was after she was, uh, she had died. They said probably after six. Isn't that what you said in the book or something like that? After six, what? After stab, after six stab wounds, oh. she probably was enough to already kill her. And I then think they, so. they, I can remember. Yeah, yeah. But they just ended up going like crazy overboard mm-hmm. with it. Yeah. So that's the next night. Then they return. No, they hitchhike. Hitchhike. That's yeah. the night that yeah. they party down at the snake yeah. pit. Yeah. And then, then they end up at Spawn Ranch. Yeah. Now Spawn Ranch gets raided. A week later, yeah. Right. And you and you say in your book, you feel like it was to justify the fact that they had let all this go down under their noses. Yeah. yeah. Because you said it was the biggest raid. In the history of California to that point, uh, yeah. Pre-dawn raid, I can't remember how many, uh, 70 or 100 officers. They had helicopters, jeeps. They circled the ranch. They had a you know a signal for them all to go in. Right, right. They round everybody up and uh, take I think twenty seven family members to the county jails and book them. And then three days later they release them all. And in the search warrant, the only individual who's named is Charles Manson. Huh. He's identified in the search warrant as somebody on federal parole. Um, who the reason they're raiding it in the warrant is they're looking for uh, guns, stolen vehicles, stolen whatever. They found everything. 
Manson had stolen credit cards. Yeah, um, I saw that Bully in your book. That was that funny. They, his book. they fell out of his pocket, right? Yeah, yeah. They weren't and, Himmons, were they? No, they were Okay, because I, I heard you say that they had Gary Himmons credit cards, right? Uh, for a little bit or something? No, they didn't. I probably misunderstood you. Yeah, Bosley might have had it when he was up in Santa Barbara. Okay. All right. But no, they were um, a psychiatrist who is, that would take another hour. That's not in my book yet, right, but right. you'll see it in the okay. second book. I will indeed. But uh, then they release them all three days later. <laughs> and Bugliosi writes, because he has to explain this in Helter Skelter. Right. And I think the raid is given about one paragraph in his like 500 and some uh, pages book. The he biggest barely, raid in history yeah, is given one yeah, paragraph. Yeah, yeah. Well, and to that point, till, in California till, history. Till the Patty Hearst thing when they burnt down, a bombed the building and burned it down with a bunch yeah. of SLA people yeah, in the yeah, late yeah. 70s. That was the second biggest. But um, I mean, that was the first biggest. Manson, the spawn was first, then that one took right, over. Right, right. So then... Uh, Bugliosi writes in Helter Skelter that the reason they were released was because the warrant was misstated. Well, I got a copy of the warrant. It's dated, the raid was August 16th. I think it's dated August 10th or something. It's not the day of the raid, but right. I took it to the law and said, we have a seven-day window on either side. Yeah. And he knew that. And all these sheriffs were furious. I go, why'd you never go public? They said, who's going to listen to us, you know? Yeah. And I said, all right, so if it's not misstated... Why were they released? So then I go to the deputy DA who signed their release, who was still a deputy DA in, in downtown. This is probably 2003, Bob Shern. And he said, uh, yeah, you're right. It's not misstated. I remember reading that in the book. I go, well, you signed the release. He goes, I can't remember. I think it was, I go, that was a big, look at, I go, all the stuff you, all the evidence. He goes, I think it was because we couldn't, pin any of the evidence to any of the people that were arrested at that point i hadn't seen the credit card report yet so they could have with that right but uh <clears throat> i said well how can you i go like what he goes well like car keys for the stolen vehicles i said they raided the ranch at five in the morning because they wanted everyone to be asleep who's going to have keys on them when they're sleeping exactly and then i went to the same people my uh pamela posh this woman in law enforcement she i think she was part of the parole commission or something and she said, that's ridiculous. You charge them with conspiracy. You've got all the evidence of theft and, you know, fe felony behavior. So you charge them all with conspiracy and then you start offering them deals to rat each other out. Yeah. It's done all the time. Right. You don't have to have their, even their fingerprints on it. See, the government can use conspiracy, but the, the moment we say it, hmm. we have a tinfoil hat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just playing. Mm -hmm. But uh, so they, uh, let me see something real quick here. And okay. then that day, they got out, uh, I think the 19th, within like 72 hours of that, they killed Shorty exactly. Shea. Exactly. That's what so I was getting to. So had they not been released, they, Shorty Shea would which, have been killed. Exactly. Exactly. And so, who knows how many others? Zero. So let me ask you a question. They, I, From what I understand, Manson ordered the hit on Shea, Shorty Shea, because he thought that he called the sheriffs on him. Were the sheriffs actually tipped off? by the young woman who was staying there that you mentioned earlier? Well, no, they were doing surveillance. I mean, they were just doing surveillance. Gathering, they've been gathering evidence. So this guy was killed for no fucking reason. Yeah, yeah. Fuck. Yeah. And they, they dismembered him, right? Uh, well, they that was a story that Clem Grogan told, that they cut his head off. But when they found the skeleton, his head okay. wasn't cut off. I think they just stabbed him a lot of times. Okay. And um, um, they didn't find his body till 77, eight years later. Why didn't they look when they knew he'd been missing? Didn't they? No, no, they looked. They looked. Oh, what they did. They just was, couldn't find him. Yeah, I, I've been wrong when I keep saying the only ones who've been paroled are Bruce Davis and um, Leslie, who've been approved. Steve Grogan, Clem, uh, was paroled. He's the only Manson family member who's actually been released. Uh, and this was before the governor had the authority to overturn it. Yeah. So he told the sheriffs the year he became eligible for parole which was like 77, mm -hmm. he contacted, actually first he contacted Burke Katz, who was the prosecutor who tried him. Yeah. And he said, I will lead you to the body in wow. the Spawn Ranch. So they went there in the middle of the night, snuck him out of prison, brought him to the Spawn Ranch, and he brought them right to where he had left them and they found bones. So then a year later, or within a year, yeah. he gets paroled and Burke Katz, the, the prosecutor, you know, spoke on, and said he should be paroled. 
what Doris Tate, when she found out after that was done in the middle of the night, it wasn't reported he was paroled until after he was released. Yeah. Uh, and then Sharon Tate's mom, uh, who because of that then went and started this whole victim's right group to keep people from being paroled. Right. She said the only reason he told them where the body was was to get paroled. Right. So is that, you know, justice that he waits and why didn't he do it three or four years right. before? What, what, okay. And he was in jail for that. So he was in jail for the Shorty Shea murder, yeah. So they already convicted without a body? Yeah, that was, it was a complicated trial. Grogan had um, two mistrials, I think, because they never had the body. But they had enough evidence and a strong enough case. So Manson, Bruce Davis, and Shea were all, con- or, excuse me, and Grogan were all convicted of Shorty's murder. Watson, for a reason nobody's ever been able to explain to me, wasn't charged with it, al- although he participated wow. in it. And... um so the body count now, the official body count. We got the official Gre- body count. Greg is Hinman. nine. Greg Hinman. Gary Hinman, yeah. Sharon Tate, her baby. Oh, yeah. If you're counting the baby, then it's 10. Wow. And then uh, who was it? Wait. F- so four and a half people. No, wait. Five people. Five and a half people at the Tate house. So six if the baby right. counts. Uh huh. Hinman before that, seven. Shay after eight. And then the La Bianca's nine and 10. Jeez. So 10 people in what? Yeah. 13 days, 14 days, two weeks. Yeah. That we know of. And then they were let go for two months. So they had to be out here just slaughtering. I mean, at that rate, you're (laughs) talking like 300 people. I don't think that that's what they were just doing all the time. But I'm just saying at that rate. Yeah. Yeah. You get them into into hundreds of deaths. Maybe. (laughs) Cushion Kim Show's exclusive. Hundreds of deaths. (laughs) I'm just playing, bro. (laughs) But uh, let me see something real quick. And then, um, okay, so then they head back to, they head to Death Valley. Well, um, they got released, yeah, about the 18th or 19th. They stayed there another two weeks. Mm -hmm. And then they went to Death Valley around the last few days of August, the first week of September. Mm -hmm. And they stayed there pretty much until they were rounded up in the middle of October. Manson came, had a few trips back to spawn. So did others. They would come back for supplies and mm-hmm. things, but they were pretty much. And that's the Barker Ranch. Yeah, it's the Barker Ranch. And then there's actually another ranch right next to it called Myers. Yeah, that's the other one. They were adjoining yeah. ranches. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, um, so from there, then they get busted finally on what day? Uh, well, the first raid of those ranches was October 10th. They got about nine or ten of them. Manson was back in Los Angeles with Bruce Davis, Steve Gro No, Bruce Davis, like four or five people. Yeah. So he wasn't there. Right. And then they knew that because he was the one guy they wanted the second time. And so they waited. And then uh, Manson came back on the 10th. And what were those charges for? Uh, Grand Theft Auto. And who was... Who was- conducting that that was at the sheriff's that was the inyo district attorney it was the inyo district attorney who was charging but the law enforcement was combined it was the parks department Mm -hmm. because they were in parks land Mm -hmm. it's a california highway patrol oh wow it was the uh inyo sheriffs okay and i feel like there was one more agency but i can't remember now it was a bit another massive right so it's more for like grand theft auto and stuff like that yeah they get them into custody and when they're in custody, that's when Susan Atkins. So Susan Atkins was brought to L.A. because they were able to pin the uh, Beausoleil murder on her. The hen, I mean, the, the Hinman murder on the hen, her. Yeah. So she was brought to lo- the women's jail. Sybil Brand. Brand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, probably Jinx. a few days after. Right. Which is say? where he said Jinx, which oh. is where you ended up. Uh, that's a sheriff's training range now, isn't it? In Monterey Park. That's that used to be Sybil Brand, and didn't you no, go there I think, to get information? Yeah, yeah, I did go there for their files, but I think Sybil Brand was downtown near the police building. Was it? Maybe I'm wrong. No, I, I think know. Sybil Brand was in Monterey Park. Really? Yeah, I think so. I have to look. That I believe up. so because that's the training. Because I've been back up in there to do filming and stuff, mm-hmm. and it's scary. I mean, yeah. there's just a bunch of sheriffs. I never seen so much stuff mm-hmm. before. Anyway, so they go, they raid the house, yeah, uh, the ranches. And they take them into custody. So Susan's, Susan's a Sybil yeah. Brown, and she Susan's starts talking Brand. to her cellmates about the murders of the Tates, Tates. and Lobby Oh, wow. Yeah. So then the cellmates contact the sheriff. Wasn't the, the cellmate's the name was Ronnie was, Howard? Ronnie Howard and Virginia Grant. Ron Howard was <laughs> in, in a female prison for some reason. We don't know what's going on there. <laughs> Richie Cunningham. Yeah, he's too young to know who Richie Cunningham is. <laughs> Happy days. 
mm. with the Fonz. He wasn't even born when that was. Hey. On. <laughs> so, um, then we got a. Uh, she's she, and then what happens from there? So then they realize that Susan and the the rest of her crew, most of them who are in the jail up in Inyo, yeah, probably killed Tate LaBianca. I think they oh, knew wow. it for months before that, but right, that's right. officially when they learned. Right, it. right. So then they needed mm. to get Charlie. You think they made that up that she never even fucking was talking about it, and they were just like, "Yeah, sure." She just was talking. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, because Ronnie, how? I mean, I'm actually, I, I talked to Virginia Graham a lot. Yeah. So she was the, the second, the two women, and Ronnie Howard was killed um, a couple years after this, and it's to this day it's an unsolved murder. Wow. Yeah, a lot of people think it was retribution. A couple years after. Yeah, like seventy three, seventy four. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, no, no doubt. Uh, but both of them were kind of lifetime con artists. They've been in and out of jail on petty theft, drugs, prostitution. They also both were married to the same man. And both of them all of a sudden are brought in on parole violations at the exact same month that they're bringing Atkins down. They're both made Atkins cellmates. And they're the ones who get the story from Susan. That sounds like it's bullshit. I asked for, I mean, I've asked Virginia, and she's this little old lady in Las Vegas who's living on hardly anything. And I'm, I have a soft spot for her because she's from Philly and she's got a real strong Philly accent, which is where I'm from. And she told me she was not, you know, working for anybody. She was horrified. She heard this story. And of course, Ronnie, it's a weird coincidence that she and Ronnie actually lived together for like two or three years with a man. It was like a three-way marriage. Right, right. And then both end up and both, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. What are the chances? I don't trust anything. Hell no. That sounds super fabricated. But so let me ask you a question. So then they they go to the trial starts. Mm -hmm. Okay. They finally, they they bring the charges up on everyone. Mm -hmm. The trial starts. And the original attorney uh, assigned to... Uh, Atkins. Susan Atkins. Well, what about Manson? Was Ronald Hughes? Oh, yeah, yeah. Ronald Hughes? Well, and he went he, through three or four before he got Irving Canaric. Right. and then But Ronald Hughes uh, ends up representing... Leslie Van Houten. And he didn't want to sell her out. No, he yeah, he didn't. He wanted to put on a defense. Right. He was the only one of the defense attorneys. So what happened was after the prosecution rests... Then the defense presents their witnesses, evidence, whatever. Right. And everyone was shocked when Canerica or whoever got up and said, defense rest. And Ron Hughes stood up and said, no, no, no. I want to represent my client. I want to put on a defense. And and Leslie and all the family members in the court, like, shut up, sit down, fight, whatever. Because right, right, they right. didn't. But he's like, no, no, I want to do it. So the judge called a recess of like a week. And during that week, Ron Hughes disappears. And, and, the, fu- and the last thing, bro, that Manson said to him, at least someone said, I, I heard that the last thing Manson said to him was, I never want to see you in this courtroom again. I think that's true. Yeah, I don't know if that's in my court. And then he died, bro, in Ventura. Fuck. In Sespe Springs. I looked that up. Yeah, Sespe Hot Springs on November 27, 1970, but they didn't find the body till March 29, 1971. Yeah. And the people, the last people that saw him were hikers, and they said that he was in a wooded area away from the floodwaters. Oh, really? I didn't yeah. know they said he was yeah. away. Away I, from the floodwaters. Yeah. And so everyone's just like, then how the fuck did he end up? You know, because yeah. everyone's like, oh, no, he, he drowned. He drowned. But, yeah, I thought that was There's wild. There's so many crazy elements to this. Uh... Yeah. It's wild. Let me ask you a question. Do you think he maintained, like, a Manson, a hierarchical structure as he was locked up? Like, let's say, imagine a, a, a mafia, a Don. You mean gets when a, he was in prison? Yes. I know he had like an army of people on the outside, um, you know, years later, Aryan Brotherhood people who were taking care of him, you know, sending him money and stuff. I don't know if there was yeah. any kind of, if he was asking them to commit crimes, but um, within prison, I don't think, I don't know. Maybe not within prison, but the, was would the family still have acted on his behalf? Oh, yeah. Well, not all of them, but the ones that, be, that remained loyal were, I can name them, Squeaky. Nancy Pittman, Squeaky From, Nancy Pittman, Sandra Good, Catherine Scher, Catherine Gillis. Those five hardcore followers were loyal to him till at least the end of the 70s. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And to this day, I, Sandra Good still is. 
Nancy Pittman chased me off her property when I tried to interview her. Uh, Catherine Scher threatened to sue me if I wrote about her after asking me to pay her a lot of money. Um, <laughs> Sandy Good won't talk to me. Yeah, yeah. That's funny. That's and, wild, and Kathy man. Gillis, who was, whose grandparents own Myers Ranch, she's the one that brought them to Death Valley. Yeah. I went to see her in Oregon, and she'd only given one or two interviews, and she told me the reason I'm in Oregon is because uh, my parole... She was in and out of prison, not, nothing con connected to the murders. Right. But she kept violating her parole by trying to visit Manson in California prison. So they ordered her to leave. If, they, if she didn't want to go back to jail, they they moved her parole to Oregon. She says, I love Charlie. He's he's my, she goes, and I love my sisters in prison. And if Sharon Tate had to go that way, she had to go that way. Fuck. Yeah. That's wild. This was probably 2005 or six. She also told me, she was really drunk uh, you know i mean she we drank all day long and she drank a lot more than i did hey. but at one point she told me um that she and the other girls had hidden shorty shay's body wow and i'm like oh that makes you an accessory she goes yeah so you better be careful about what you're right the next day she calls me up and she goes don't put that in your book and i go i put whatever i want in my book she goes I would made that up. I didn't. I, I go, why? And she goes, because you were pissing me off and I wanted to scare you. I go, you were pretty persuasive. <laughs> I didn't put in the book, not for yeah. that reason. But he put it on Cushion Kim Trails. Burr, 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 burr. And she's, she, unfortunately, she died. She's going to knock on my fucking door. Oh, I <laughs> no, guess she died. Not. Yeah, yeah. Oh, she might have. She was still fierce. Might have a <laughs> she might have. Yeah. Fuck, <laughs> dude. That's crazy, bro. So they all end up getting the death penalty, but it gets... Committed they got, to life sentences? Yeah, because the state Supreme Court overturned death. Right. No, no death. So then they also became automatically eligible for parole after the certain number of years. So I think it was maybe 10 years since the crime, so like 79 or right. 78. No, no, if, if Grogan got out in 77 or 78, it was as soon as they became eligible that he got out. Right. Um, yeah, and you know, two of them have died in prison, Manson and Atkins. Mm-hmm. And the ones that are left in prison are Bobby, Beausoleil, Bruce Davis, and Leslie and Patricia. And wow. Tex. Yeah. And the only one I visited is Bruce Davis in prison. Wow. Um, the others mostly wouldn't see me. Or, or mostly I just talked to them on the phone. What a labor of love, bro. 20 years. <laughs> That's wild. Tell me this, Tom. Outside of uh, your investigative journalism, which, bravo, I mean, shit, 20 years, crazy. <laughs> That's wild, bro. And you're um, being an author, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, what are your other passions? Uh, oh, I don't know. It's like I never had anything to think about besides this. But, <laughs> I mean, what do I do for fun? Or either, what do you do to unwind? Because I know that's intensive work that you're doing. Yeah, I drank too much. I, I, you know, when you said you met with a lot of these people, it sounded like you guys had a good time. Sometimes. Anytime people wanted to drink with me, I was never going to say no because there I knew go. that loose lips, you know. Right, right. Uh, right. This guy. Yeah. I mean, now that I've had a year or two since it's come out, well, I, <laughs> this huge six month trip plan starting this past March that I had to cancel because of COVID. Mm. So I still haven't really taken, I, I, this summer, I drove across country. My mom turned 94 yesterday. Right. And nice. I wanted to see her and my family on the East Coast. And I didn't want to fly because it was July and, you know, people thought planes are dangerous. So I drove across country, was real careful, quarantined. Then we took her out of her old folks' home for a week at the beach. It was great. Cool. And then I was coming back in August and I thought, well, I'm going to take my time. Why rush back? So I did take two months, and I just went all over the country visiting friends. I taught my, I've never camped in my life. I camped a little bit. It was kind of disastrous. Man, good for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now I'm, uh, I'm hoping, you know, we had a movie deal. Uh, Amazon Studios bought Option the Book, but they can't, they ended it in November. Mm. So it's a mixed blessing because Amazon insisted on doing a feature film. And I never want, I wanted it to be a limited series because there's just too much information. Yeah. 
And the poor guy that they hired, who's a really great, you know, A-list screenwriter, he spent two and a half years. He got paid, so, but he spent two and a half years working his butt off. And he said to me, now I know why your book took you 20 years. I don't know how to condense all this yeah. stuff. So he ended up finishing the script in November and Amazon <coughs> said, you know what, we're going to pull the plug on it. So that meant that I don't get another <clears throat> fee. And if they actually make it, then you make a lot of money. So that meant that, oh, shit. No, I got to start worrying about money again. But the good news is now we can have it made like we want it made, which is limited series. Yeah. So my agency just put together this plan about a week ago, and they're taking it out to some really exciting people to uh, see if they'll do a limited series. That'd be so amazing. that's the kind of thing I'm really looking forward to happening. And uh, what about the next book? Well, that's it. I'm trying, you know, when this book was done, I thought if I do another book, I want it to be the complete opposite. I want to write about ponies and princesses and lollipops. Can I write the foreword? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm joking. I could never write that. No, but maybe a not something in fiction or whatever. But now that it's done, and this is the curse, is all these people who have relevant information contact me. Mm. And in the beginning, it was mostly nuts. And to, to this day, it's like, I used to say 90% crazy. Now, for whatever reason, it's down to like one out of two calls are good. So I get emails and calls from people every day. And about I have like three or four people that I, I'm rotating with information that are giving me information. Some people are just researchers who are obsessed with this and have access to stuff I never had access to. Mm -hmm. Some of it is people who are involved specifically in the assassinations which the book gets into, but we didn't talk about here, yeah. thank God, yeah. or into the murders. And they're like all these people have come forward from the case that wouldn't talk to me 20 years ago. Now they're ready to talk to me. That's wild. So maybe, probably, it's going to be a second book on this same stuff. Yeah. But hopefully, I'm only going to do it if I can get enough really important new information to put in a book. So the basic summary is the leftists that were anti-war in the 60s Apparently, it seems as if the FBI had a program called COINTELPRO and the CIA had a program called CHAOS and they used those programs to infiltrate different sects of whatever. And then neutralize them, which was their <laughs> exactly. official word. And also the Black Panthers, the as, Panthers as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, Hoover, the head of the FBI, called the left-wing movement the biggest threat to domestic uh, national security that the country had ever right. known. He believed that it was all being funded by communists. Right. And then the Panthers were, um, the Panthers, the left, you know, the anti-war movement. This right. is when it's, Vietnam was really raging out of control. But they were what the, these right-wing military intelligence agencies decided they had to, to squash, you mm -hmm. know, by any means necessary. Gotcha. And they were doing what they call psychops, um, mm -hmm. where in the case of the Panthers, and again, this is not my findings, this came out in the 70s, they were literally setting up, infiltrating Panthers and rival black militant groups and getting them, provoking them into killing each other by making them think they were about to be attacked right. or something. They did that at UCLA, right? Yeah, yeah, two, two of them were killed there, three. And this was in November of 68. Mm. And one of the memos I have in my book, uh, I can't remember if it was Hoover or one of his underlings, wrote to the head of the L.A. office, and, and this was about six months before Tate LaBianca, and said, what we have to do is turn the whites that are supporting the Black Panthers away from them because it had become very chic to have Panthers over. So Jane Fonda, Warren Beatty, Nicholson, they were doing fundraisers and stuff, and they right. actually called themselves the White Panthers right. who were supporting them. We and the, and the memo had said, we have to make... The, the whites supporting the Panthers think that when the revolution finally happens, they're going to be lined up against a wall and killed with everybody else. Then, like, six months later, all these white supporters of the Panthers at this house that kind of represented the chicest, you know, group of people in Hollywood right. where rock and roll people, Polanski, Sharon. I mean, if you saw Tarantino's movie, right, right. he really captured that, that, not the Manson family part, right, right. but uh, that part. And then all of a sudden, they're slaughtered up there, and people are terrified of not so much the Panthers, but just hippies. Once, not until three months later, when Manson's taken into custody, right. and for the first time, 
they don't look like peaceful beatniks with beads and paisley or whatever, but all of a sudden like crazed murderers. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So was that a mission accomplished? Who knows? Right. So at the same time, you got MK Ultra going on. That's the CIA. That's how running. it's done. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that's how it's done. Mm-hmm. All right. And then we have the perfect candidate in Charles Manson, mm-hmm. who spent 16 of his 32 years mm-hmm. as of 1967 mm-hmm. when he's paroled. Mm hmm. In federal institutions, mm-hmm. right? Never, ever uh, county or state. It was always federal. Always federal. And Bulios even points that out in Helter Skelter. He said it was beyond him how someone like Manson, every single violation was federal. And when he went to prison for, he was picked up in 60 for violating, not showing up to one appointment in LA and they violated him. Mm-hmm. But he was originally paroled for uh stealing a check from the mail for $37 and he got 10 years sentence for that. So if you want to think conspiracy, like the Mm -hmm. federal government needed him inside for periods of time to do what they needed to do. And then when he was outside, they needed to keep him outside until he did what he had to do. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So he paroles, he does countless things that get violated. Mm -hmm. We went over all that. Mm Mm-hmm. He's got carte blanche, basically, mm-hmm. and he never gets violated. And then these killings take place, which also implicate the Black Panthers, which mm-hmm. was another group they wanted to get rid yeah. of. So yeah. it's like a two for one mm-hmm. if if it would have worked. Right. Mm-hmm. So you tie that in together. Mm-hmm. So it's all like, oh, shit, dude, you're connecting these dots. And then they all get busted and mm-hmm. shipped away and. Mm-hmm. Out comes Helter Skelter. Mm-hmm. And that, you know. The book was a bestseller, and then he did a TV movie, I think, in 76. Yeah, I think you said he was bragging about it when you went to interview yeah, he was, him. he would brag about everything he could think about. But it was, it was the most viewed television hours until, I don't know. Roots. Something like that. That's yeah. what he said. Oh, Roots. yeah. Oh, he said, said that to me? Book. Yeah. God, you said, got a better... I can't remember half I of just read it last night, which bro. Which is another okay. PSYOP, Roots. I just read it last <laughs> right? Alvin Haley. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Alex. Alex Haley, yeah. excuse Alex. me. But he didn't even write that. Supposedly. Is that true? That's what I've heard. I wonder who wrote That's it. That's another PSYOP, yeah. Really? CIA? Shit. Don't make me go down more rabbit holes. <laughs> really start writing down again. I'm not, I'm not taking more notes. Yeah. No. Well, that was fucking amazing, bro. I can't thank you enough. Yeah, I'm yeah. glad For coming out this. here. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really glad because I've been down this rabbit hole for two or three weeks. And uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, the fact that you're here right now is amazing. Crazy. I want to hear right. what you think when it's you like get to dream. the end of the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't wait. I Definitely, I'm going to knock it out tonight. Shit. <laughs> I got up. plenty of time to do it. How you feeling, brother? You good over there? Great. You look good. You look like you feel good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Like All we right, do about man. this time. Well, hey, thanks everyone out there for listening. For sure. Thanks for tuning in. And you know the name of the book. Hold it up one more time, brother. Oh, yeah. Chaos. Let me get that last part, though. Charles Manson, The CIA and the Secret History of the 60s by Tom O'Neill with two L's. <laughs> Pick it up today. It's the best $20 you Insert will applause ever here. spend. Thank you again for sure. coming. Appreciate you. We really Thanks. appreciate it, brother. All right, you guys. Till next time. Later. Cushion Camp Trails. Thank y'all. That was good. Thank you, brother. It's good to have people that are informed asking me questions because sometimes they don't know. Kush and Kentrash, the world's most dangerous podcast.